Hey, what's going on, brother? How are you? Perfect. That's what we like to... Uh... Well, there's a first time for everything, and uh, I tell you, I'm just uh, honored to be the guinea pig, and uh, we'll work through any technical difficulties that we encounter on the fly, like we always do. Yeah, so it looks like that you are uh, muted on the YouTube end. <clears throat> okay, there we go. You hear that okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> I think we're good. Perfect. Now you can no hear more, me. No more bugs. Told yes. you, man. First time. First time. No, first time. it was it was the exact same issue I told you about. I that the one USB port died, and I plugged it right back in. I just out of habit. I obviously was not paying attention, so that's how that no, goes. That's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we are working through it, and here we are. Yeah, live. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you joining. Uh, obviously, I had I had you and Dale. I had you and Dale on that that podcast. God, that must have been that was a month or two ago now, right? Where we yeah, talked, man, it was. Yeah, we talked about deployment and some of the funnier stories. But for anyone who didn't make that one, because it was pretty long, I think we chatted for a good three hours. For anyone who didn't make that, can you give another just like quick bio about you? Um, very broad. Obviously, you don't have to talk too much detail. But yeah, your uh, your career so far and the transition to infantry, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, man. Um, so. Uh, kind of a little interesting journey. Uh, I joined the uh, Army National Guard back in 2012, uh, originally as a uh, 12 November, which is a horizontal construction engineer, um, otherwise known as a heavy equipment operator. Uh, I've done the first six years um, in the Guard um, with the engineers, and of course, that's where I got to meet you and, and the boys on our tour to uh, the Middle East and Syria. Um, when we got back from that tour, um, I was coming up on the tail end of that contract, and Decided that I wanted to kind of do a career change, and, and the infantry, I thought, was a good fit for me. Um, so I, I, I re-enlisted under an 11 Bravo contract. I went to uh, the reclassification school at uh, Fort Pickett, Virginia, um, where I qualified as an infantryman. And uh, now that's uh, what I do. Um, I'm an infantry squad leader. And uh, so far, I absolutely love it. Uh, I just recently deployed to Kosovo on a uh, NATO peacekeeping mission to work with a host of our NATO allies. Uh, on the civilian side, I'm a quality management system monitor for the largest Toyota manufacturing plant in North America. That's fancy. I saw your yeah, uh, I saw yeah, your fancy absolutely. Toyota um, signature block earlier. Did you like that? You know, I, I, I tried to you know I tried to elevate myself a little bit there, and uh, <laughs> I was like, how how can I make myself look classy and professional at the same it, time? So you did it. Put I did big Toyota letters on your email. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was pretty big. You know, I miss my uh, I do miss my Tacoma. I won't lie to you. Um, oh, man, I'm telling you, such a great truck. Yeah, uh, I had an SX, and I absolutely love that truck. Um, 
They're very versatile. And yeah. as you know, uh, Toyota Thon, baby, never stops. Uh, we're doing uh, operations all around the world, whether it be a Hilux, a Land Cruiser, or an anti aircraft gun strapped at the back of a Hilux. So we got you covered, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> want one of those to run around here. I feel like that'd be a lot of fun. But uh, no, I, I actually oh, man, was, yeah. um, I saw the new Tundra and that red, that red and black Tundra. And I was like, oh, man, oh, man it looks, it looks good. Um, yeah, they, they are something to be seen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the, the beauty, beautiful thing about our company, man. It's just the innovation. I'm yeah. very proud to work for. Um, and we got a lot more things coming down the pipe that I'm really excited for. All right. Well, stop plugging Toyota because they're not paying for this shit. So. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. No, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. <laughs> I don't mind. I just had to give you <laughs> shit. Um, so I, I don't know if I asked you last time, what actually made – what made you switch – from the engineers why why'd you turn into a uh, a dirty trader <laughs> i figured that question was going to come sooner or later yeah um you know that's a, that's actually a good question and i can't tell you how many times ever since i got to the infantry battalion people have asked me that question yeah um i think it was more of a personal personal thing man um i love the engineers uh i love what we did um and that's that's going to be of course a, a significant part of my career and my storytelling of course. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to change a pace, and I think that uh, with the with the infantry was just a good fit for me, my mentality. Um, I kind of wanted to get out and do more field ops, and um, that that's kind of the thing about the army that I that I love is you know just getting out there and that patrol base, right? You know, going through the motions with the guys, um, and and really working on those small unit tactics. I find that fascinating. Um, and so that's kind of where I wanted to to take my career and also open up opportunity for schools and other things of that nature uh, so far it's been it's been great um you know the the recent the recent deployment to kosovo really just kind of sealed the deal for me and made me realize that i made the right decision um yeah man i know it's kind of um <laughs> unheard of because a lot of the times you see guys coming out of the infantry and going into um you know other mos's or more maybe more of a cush job because right you know, the infantry does take a toll on the body but um yeah, you know, I'm still young. I still got some life in me, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I would <laughs> to hope be so. Determined. To be no, determined, no, no. yeah. Yeah, man, but um yeah, so that's that's kind of where I'm at with that. Good. And and uh you had said that I think you told me previously though that the Syria experience with all that chaos that we went through kind of like pushed that a little bit for across the line for you cuz we I mean, we were we lived outside the wire that entire time almost. I'm obviously being uh dramatic, you know, but we we didn't spend much time on the fob. I mean, I I think that was definitely a shock for most of the guys. I mean, they wanted the action. You remember? Uh, you remember how much everyone wanted to, wanted to get out of, outside the wire, and then when we finally did, it was a different ball game. So I imagine that was a motivator. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that deployment kind of really sealed the deal for me. Um, it kind of made me realize that that's 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 more of where I want to be. Right. I kind of want to be more hands on, direct action, kind of in the fight. Um, you know, and I think ultimately, and you can relate to this, that's kind of where the most rewarding, um, experiences that you have in your career are made and fostered in that field environment. Um, you know, it's, it's, I kind of use this analogy. It's, you know, if you're on a basketball team, you sit on the bench all the time, Yeah. right? It's, you, you want to play the game. Um, and that's not, that's not like a, a glory boy thing or anything like that. No, 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 no. It's just simply wanting to get out there and get your hands dirty, get in the field, and and, and do your job and serve your country, man. And that's just kind of um, where uh, I'm at mentally with that. But yeah. uh, Syria definitely, definitely changed my view on a lot of things. Um, when you see, um, you know, the the level of, of just chaos and destruction and, and the scheme of operations and everything that was going on during that time and how kinetic it was. Um, that was just a fascinating opportunity, especially as a young E5 team leader, uh, to experience those things and get that experience under your belt so early in my career. I'm very blessed and very fortunate. And, you know, I take a lot of those stories and lessons learned now and, and teach my guys because they're so, you know, yearning for, for knowledge and, and wanting to learn. Yeah. And, um, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, in another life, I feel like, uh, I don't know. I feel like in another life, I probably would. Well, no, that's not true because I, I like being in the field. Like you said, I, I think I, I still have a soft spot in my heart for armor and artillery. You know, I, I, I obviously got family history in artillery, but I keep I keep seeing a lot of the armor stuff. And I'm like, damn, it looks like fun. <laughs> maybe <laughs> yeah, in, dude, maybe in another life. But, uh, you know, I Especially still when... go ahead. 
no, I, I just wanted to, to fall into that. Yeah, especially when you're the infantryman with a 90-pound uh, rucksack on the side of the road and you see the mechanized boys or some nice, beautiful vehicles passing by. You're like, oh, what the heck am I doing? But, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, you know, doing sometimes doing infantry stuff, it, you know, it's it's fun too, but you're right. Like, it, I, I, I can't imagine doing it now um, in that same capacity. It just, like you said, it, it tears tears you down and uh, – God, uh, Syria wrecked like wrecked my knees. Um, so I don't, I don't know how you're doing it, but you're kind of a beast. <laughs> All you guys were beasts compared to compared to me. I, you know, when I when, you, when I think about that, um, I was looking at some of the footage. You know that we mm-hmm. we we gathered. Um, I'm so you know this is one thing I tell people too, man. Um, take pictures, take videos, document yeah. those moments, man, because yeah. I'm telling you, it's so easy to forget. And just like we talked about. When we were going through those photos, you're like, "Wow, man, I didn't even remember that certain day or that that photo." Yeah, yeah, and it man. Just brings back all these memories, and also too, uh, man, we were working hard. You know, we were pushing yeah. sometimes 14 plus hour days, um, in 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 with the the missions and stuff that we had, uh, the logistics, and then getting out there and making it happen. Um, it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. But I tell you what, what a great group to be with, and I think that. Our wheelhouse of minds was just outstanding. Um, oh yeah, being able I, to get the job done, and then on top of that too, motivated soldiers, physically fit, ready to go, um, and we got it done. I'm really proud of yeah. that. I've had a really, really hard time articulating just how smart. Uh, I won't name them on here because you know we, ha- we haven't talked to them prior about being named, but our two main bridge guys, you know who, basically Top and uh, and Mac. Um, God, like they, yeah, some of the stuff that they did from a math perspective and an improvisation perspective, and then the guys themselves also contributed heavily. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they didn't, but like, I am still blown away by it. Truly. Um, I don't know how, we, I just don't know how we would have done it without them. I, I, the team we've said before, it was probably too top heavy, you know, um, a lot of high ranking folks, <laughs> one or two really like quote unquote low ranking people. And that, that makes it difficult because everyone Everyone there is smart. Everyone there has earned a leadership position, and that makes it tough to. But at the same time, we were all kind of sort of grunts by the end, except for me because I had to do the powerpoints. If you get to do the powerpoints, <laughs> you're not a grunt, apparently. Yeah, oh, somebody's got to do them. Somebody's got to paint the picture, yeah. right? Somebody's do you, do you remember? Do you remember like when we first got? I don't know if you remember when we first got there. I was doing like two or three a day in Syria. Yeah. And I was like, can I not do these every day? Cause like I, we got stuff to do. Like I, we would get back from mission. I'd be working on more for the next two, three days. And they finally like worked with me that I was, I could basically turn in a report once a week. You know, we got our convoy that we got our convoy ops like uh, approved prior, but beyond that, man, it was just, it was just silly, but just it could always be worse. Work. Yeah, it, it could, but I, I'm telling you, and I'll never forget our uh, sheep pin talk. Yeah, uh, super cozy, and there was just a lot going on in there. Right. Um, and what what's amazing too is the ability to bring that command and control, mm-hmm. right? To bring those resources in the middle of a uh, a sheep pen in northern Syria and be able to operate on that scale and the communication that we had was just really impressive. And it right. really goes to show you. Um, just how how good that we became at at, at doing that, mm-hmm. um, and ex- especially from for me as the enlisted side, you know, a lot of times we don't get to you know see that internal, uh, you know, at, at the jock or the talk at that level, right? So being actually uh, able to be a part of that and seeing that inner workings was something special. But yeah, man, I can remember you over there on that computer, just kind of like, oh, you know, get that French press ready. We got to get that black rifle flowing <laughs> through the veins to keep going. Uh, oh, making man. a deal with the boys down there in the first cab, uh, getting those rippets before the convoys. Oh, yeah, man. Um, I still remember our... uh, saluting that French press before I left. I left it there on that desk. I was... <laughs> Do you think that the French press deserves a RCOM or an MSM? It does. At a minimum, an RCOM. It really does. I don't know. I, we had people coming to our talk for uh, French press because we had the creamer, we had the sugar, we had the good stuff, and then we had some of that uh, Turkish coffee, too. It's good. Yeah, so we we were kind of like the uh, mobile Starbucks as well. We should probably get that attached to that mobile Starbucks. <sighs> didn't even, but yeah, absolutely. didn't even charge anything. That's stupid. No, no, we're just Damn you know, we're we're good folk, good hardworking blue collar engineers, man. Come on in. Yeah, well, I'm over that now. I want to make money now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
I feel you on that. Bro. Yeah, I know you I do. You I know you do. So, um, well, that's good. That's that's good. I like like you said, that's a good lesson for any for everyone military going in, coming out, take more photos. I don't have nearly enough photos. Uh, I wish I had taken more. I I've been relying on you guys for photos, all your albums on like Facebook and whatnot. That's right. And every once in a while, I'll check a news article and I find I see myself and I'm like, oh god, because uh, when we were training the Iraqis, that pops up in completely irrelevant articles. In fact. We're gonna to get to it in a second because we're gonna to talk to uh we're gonna talk about the attacks on the U.S. bases and whatnot. But I was looking up information, just some details for that for this chat, and I found myself, uh, pastor, and um three other three other guys uh doing training the Iraqis on the on the water. And I was like, I, I did, it was like Asian Times or something, and it was completely it wasn't relevant to the article at all. But it was from Taji, so that's a good little segue. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, we had a few things that we had, we had chatted about prior that I figure we can hone in on. I, I'm realizing probably in hindsight that the title for this this episode is very vague and sort of misleading, but whatever. We'll just we're just gonna roll with it. Just roll with it. Just we'll roll do it with live, it, man. Like Bill O'Reilly said, we'll do it live. <laughs> you know, f it. Yeah, f it. Whatever. F Don't it. care. So what we're gonna talk about first is the attacks on the military bases across basically across the Middle East. That started after the uh, October seventh, after the uh, uh, sorry, the Hamas attack on Israel, and I just wanted to kind of pull up the maps. I'm going to change over here a little bit so we can talk a little about yeah. a little bit more detail. So this picture I have is a little bit outdated. This was I want to say a couple of weeks, uh, 18 days ago. So it's a little bit outdated now. I think I want to say I saw a recent number that said 70 attacks on U.S. bases, but I, don't quote me. I, I can keep looking 74. for yeah. 74 is right now roughly the number, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, now that the ceasefire has to put, I, I see that to increase. Yeah, well, so I was going to ask you about that. So one thing, you know, one, and again, this is a uh, – we're, we're staying completely apolitical on this. We're just speaking generally from a big picture and also a little picture perspective because that's a reality. You and I are like the littlest picture possible here because we're not – we're not senior commanders, you know, we're obviously not two stars. So, uh, our opinion on this is very focused on the, on the, the micro, but, uh, 52 attacks on the U S military forces since October 7th. This was as of 18 days ago. And I want to say there was another one, maybe a day or two ago, uh, another drone attack on Al Assad. Again, don't quote me there. So you and I, and we basically were at almost like a good chunk of all these, obviously we were far North from Al Tanf, but uh, we were at Al Assad or Beal, uh, you know, near Baghdad and Taji. I just want to kind of hear again. You're you're an infantry squad leader. You're an NCO, so you're in Iraq right now, and you're seeing this going on. I just kind of want to know what your thoughts are on on this whole situation. You can talk about uh, Israel, Hamas, Palestine. You can talk about that if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, just give me your give me your two cents on it all. Yeah, so you know, this is a threat that is very hard to deal with as far as a infantryman on the ground. Um, when we're talking about the use of drones, which is something that we've seen skyrocket since the Ukraine war, and even back in 2017 when we were on the ground, uh, I uh, I don't want to I don't even want to give them credit, but the the the, uh, <laughs> the folks on the ground there were starting to use uh, COTS drones or conventional off-the-shelf drones, things you can find at Walmart and Amazon being very effective at, at putting mortars and other explosive devices on these and being able to target uh, forces on the ground and, and create chaos. So the big thing for me is how do we combat that threat? What tools do I have in my tool belt to combat that threat? So um, we've started to see a huge increase in the UAS and counter UAS trainings within the infantry uh, companies now. Uh, so we do have some handheld options such as the drone buster and things of that nature that can actually jam these drones um, and cause them pretty much to go into an auto hover function and uh, descend onto the ground. But if I'm there at that at that time, I'm hoping that I have a ADA asset or air defense artillery asset. I'm hoping that I have some sort of CRAM or early, early morning detection as we've seen uh, with the, the – a lot of guys refer to it as the blimp or the balloon yeah. up top, right? Uh, those are things that I'm hoping that I have if I'm if I'm on the fob. If I'm outside the wire, one thing that we have to remember, especially, is to be vigilant, head on a swivel. I cannot stress that enough to 
my soldiers. And that's not necessarily just being 0, 5, 25, looking left, right, and what's horizontal. We have to start looking vertical as well. We have to start listening, right? Those are things that we have to incorporate into our, our TLPs once we go out. Um, so it's definitely a nerve-wracking scenario for uh, any infantryman on the ground. Um, and even uh, now, as you can see, even mechanized, right? You have to be buttoned up, uh, hatches closed, because that threat now is a real thing that we have to not take lightly. Right. Yeah, and the the drone buster that's that handheld one that looks like something from Halo, right? It's uh, yes. I've never actually gotten to to play with one myself. What what's what's the primary? Is it's just electronic jamming? Is it is it like a microwave shot? Like what exactly is it? Just for the for layman's terms. Yeah, so of course I'm not a uh, an expert on the actual uh, technology that's behind it. However, basically from what I have uh, been told by my soldiers that were trained on it prior to our last mobilization. Uh, it pretty much is a jamming. Uh, it's a it's a portable jammer that has a um, upgraded range. It's kind of like a cone signal, right? That you identify the aerial threat that is coming to the AO. You target that threat. You pretty much pull the trigger, and it jams the signal that the operator of the drone has. Um, it pretty much causes them to fall out of the sky. Some of them, uh, it will cause them to go into an auto hover. Uh, when a drone loses signal, most of them will either uh, go into an auto hover mode where they'll they'll land where they are or they'll try to return to their um, last um, positioned home station i guess you could say some of them are programmable in that nature but basically it just jams the frequency that the drone operates on and causes it to descend um, some of them you know you got to think about this as well you got to stay on target right you got to keep that signal on that drone and so once that drone lands, if it's in an auto hover mode, now we have the potential threat of a UXO IED, right? And this is when you have to think about EOD assets and other things of that nature. Um, so it's um, it's not ideal, but it's it's a tool to have, right? Right, um, of course. And, and, I, and I'm starting to see the seriousness, right, uh, as far as big armies concerned about this threat, which is good because we really have – to think about these things now this is something that's going to affect us in all of our future operations yeah no absolutely i we, we've been it's been it's been talked about a lot and actually before we, i want to i'm going to follow up with another question about the drone training and whatnot but uh christy christy and chat had a good question and i'm going to just going to narrate it real quick with uh since we've been there which iraq syria the whole nine yards uh, are the number of attacks on u.s bases bigger than it was about a decade ago my my thought I'd have to look up the actual data because you know what it's like. I mean, when you're there, it feels like an awful lot. I want to say that because this event is a little bit more, it's pretty significant, right? I mean, this this was a pretty significant event. It does feel like the last month or so has been a higher rate of, you know, quick quick attacks. Now, when they were pushing ISIS out of Mosul, there were a lot of those attacks, but not as much not as much on us that I recall. I don't I don't remember a whole lot of attacks on Al Assad or Erbil or anything like that. It does, it does feel like it's a little bit more now. Again, I'm not basing that on a quantitative analysis. Like, I don't I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at the data. I just It's just kind of a feeling that it, it feels more pointed uh, in a direct response to a very recent event. And Matt, what do you, th I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, up until recently, I, I, Christy, I would say that it, it probably has. Um, for the most part, you have to think about where we are in Syria at this point. Basically, uh, IS is in what I call IS 2.0, which they've kind of fractured, and you have small groups that are still trying to carry out operations, recruit, and such. Most of the faction is is detained in uh, prisons that are ran by our SDF or YPG, YPG counterparts, and coalition forces are, are helping provide logistics to, to facilitate that. Um, however, we still have to think about Syria uh, being a huge playground for proxy forces, where we're talking about Houthi rebels or Hezbollah. Uh, there, and to be honest with you, I kind of compare it to the Wild West. There's a lot of factions that are on the ground there currently. Um, I would say that, you know, since the really kinetic times, right, of, you know, 2016, 17, 18 even, this is probably the most attacks that we've seen in, in, recent, in recent months 
Um, you know, and these are not isolated incidents. These are, you know, focused attacks um, in a direct response to the recent uh, events um, with uh, uh, the Hamas and Israel conflict. Do you suspect? And of course, that's just uh, my kind of personal, you know, Joe opinion about it. <laughs> the Joe opinion is what what I want to hear, right? I mean, like I, I think we've. I don't know. I'm so tired of hearing from quote unquote experts, and the reality is that the guys and gals on the ground are the ones that I want to hear from, you know? And I, Absolutely. so I, I think you're, I think you're spot on. What I'm curious is, do you think now no one, God forbid, knock on wood, no one's been killed by these attacks so far. Uh, I've heard reports of some drones crashing, you know, outside the fobs and not even making it there. I've heard, uh, yes, they just land correct. in empty spots. Do you think, do you think that's because they're being interfered with, or do you think that the the, the quality of the drones themselves, and maybe the the operators, are just not up to task yet? What do you I mean? What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a variety of factors that come into play with that. I think now that since this conflict has taken off, that our assets have greatly increased in the region. You've seen recent deployments of ADA assets to the region. Um, I think that also too, um, a lot of these are just maybe on the fly type deals. You know, hopefully we make it. Um, they might be using less effective technology or, or cheaper drones. Um, we have seen, um, there's been reports of roughly 59 personnel that have been wounded in these, including some TBIs. Yeah. So that makes me think that there are some, I would say, quote unquote, big boy drones that are being used as well um, by uh, these proxies. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of the times, as you know, um, you know, you point a mortar in a direction, hopefully it hits, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it's the constant pressure, right? I think that's what they're trying to go for. They're trying to constantly pressure uh, U.S. interests, mm -hmm. and they want to try to uh, control that domain. But ultimately, I think that now that we are starting to take this threat more serious, we probably put more assets on the ground, I would say. Yeah. Um, to to deter those. And you are right. I've also seen the reports that a lot of these are not even making it um, to the, I would say, the the interior perimeter. Right. A lot of them are falling short, some miles away, some several hundred meters away. Yeah. And what, what I'm curious is because you remember when when Trump uh, ordered the strike on. Um, shit, what's his name from my from Iran? So many. I, I can never say his name right. I'm Soleimani, just, yeah. Soleimani. I think it's Soleimani. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, not... I'm horrible with pronunciations of, of name. I just I can't do I, it. I, but, trust me, me too. Yeah. But when, you know, he ordered that strike, which is pretty significant. And then Iran responded with the the pretty, pretty large Chris missile barrage into, yes. uh, you know, that that one had been communicated prior, basically, that they were not going to hit barracks. Like they were basically saying, like we're gonna hit the base, but they, they purposefully did not hit, you know, uh, soft targets that would result in a lot of dead U.S. troops. Like it was, it was, it was, you know, one of those things behind the scenes. We hit you, hit us. We're gonna hit you back, but we're gonna avoid a larger war because that's the reality. Iran doesn't want a war with us. We don't want a war with Iran, right? Like Absolutely. that. No one wants that shit. So Absolutely. what I'm kind, what I'm partly curious, especially with the the Carney, the USS Carney. Uh, I think that was the ship that reported that the, the missiles were landing like 10 kilometers off target. Part of me is like wondering, is it the quality of the rockets or is it purely posturing? And I suspect it's like a little bit of both. I'm, I'm curious if they're truly trying to kill U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or if this is simply politics by another means but slightly less than war, you know, I, I, I no, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a very good assessment. Yeah. And I, I would agree with you. And, you know, when we, we think about the Carney too, with those um, things being launched from Yemen, right. Um, or the drone that was just recently shot down that came in close proximity. I think a lot of it is, is harassment, right? right? A lot of it is posturing. A lot of it is like, Hey, we're here. We're the opposition. We don't want you here. Um, it's, it's more of trying to threaten us while we operate in those domains. Um, and, and I gotta be, I gotta say, I'm very happy that, um, commanders are, or, you know, that's the beautiful thing about the United States military is those commanders on board can make those real time decisions of whether or not they deem it necessary to, to engage these threats. And, 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 and that's something that I think when we talk about decentralized command that makes the U S military so effective is being able to make those decisions. And show that, you know, hey, we're here. We're not going anywhere. 
Um, but I, I do agree with you on that. I think that most of it is just going to be uh, posturing and, and harassment because, yeah, you're exactly right. They don't want to get drawn out into a large-scale conflict. I think everybody knows how that ends, right? right? Um, it's just mainly, hey, can we p apply enough pressure to maybe get them to push out or maybe can we gain some ground here or can we gain influence or at least paint the narrative, right, that we uh, have more influence than we actually do. Yeah, but you know, to an extent, it does work because you know one of the one of the 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 critiques right now, and again, this is not. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's a critique. But one of the critiques right now is that our our responses to these attacks are either they're not sharp enough, or it's just kind of like I don't know how to describe it. Not fumbled. Fumbled is a strong a strong word. <laughs> I don't I don't want to say that, but it does it does sort of seem like the responses aren't tit for tat necessarily uh and i'm i'm kind of i'm kind of wondering at, at what point i mean what's going to happen i think someone's going to get seriously hurt to the point that they're going to get they're going to you know yes. someone get killed and then it's then it's this whole thing of well we had a hundred plus attacks leading up what do we do to stop that happening and but the, the flip side of that argument is that if you overreact sometimes bad things can happen now granted when they ordered that attack on the iranian high-ranking individual that that scared the shit out of me. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was completely shocked by that because that was an assassination of a. I mean, that'd be like you know someone uh, ordering an attack would, on a on a U.S. general in Kuwait or something. You know, it would have been like this the equivalent of someone coming after General Milley, right? Right. You're talking about the leader of the Quds Force. We're not talking about some you know CO out in a tent in the middle of the desert. We're talking about someone who has for years been a significant key leader right um in the ir and on, and on top of that who's been responsible for training and moving weapons and assets throughout a variety of aos right um so you know this was someone that was was very beloved uh by his country and someone that was very beloved by the government right. so yeah i totally agree with you i was kind of um like <sighs> okay well let's kind of <laughs> see how this plays out yeah and you know for me, um, that kind of also made me think back to when 2017, um, when the uh, you know President Trump ordered the cruise missile attack on the uh, Syrian airfield that was responsible for the launch of the chemical attacks. Um, I, we were there, um, and I and I yeah. can remember that um, that feeling of like, <laughs> okay, uh, what's next? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I believe that was the uh, Al Shrat uh, airfield. Um, if I'm, I might be butchering that name. I know that you both are not the best with those names. But, like I said, man, you got me. I'm the wrong person to have on the call uh, for, <laughs> for for <laughs> pronunciations. I, I don't know why I'm so bad at it, but um, yeah, uh, that yeah. was a big move. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and I, I gotta I gotta agree with you on something. Uh, I've thought about this too multiple times. Um, is it gonna take, unfortunately, someone getting killed to proportionately respond? I hope that it doesn't. Um, I believe that we have conducted a total of three or four um, precision airstrikes on targets. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but you do not see a decrease, right? You do not see a, a lull or a pause. I mean, 70 plus attacks in this time frame, that is a very, very significant uh, deal. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that we really need to evaluate. Um, moving forward on what is going to be the ultimatum here what's going to be that red line of like hey you're not going to cross this so yeah that's a that's a good debate for uh some people that maybe make a little bit more money than we do but from a <laughs> from from a joe standpoint from our standpoint it's also very discouraging right when you're on the ground and you're doing these operations and you're constantly being harassed you're constantly getting attacked by these things you know, for me and you, we want to go on the attack at that point, right? We're right. ready to go. We're, we're ready to go tit for tat. So and that's drilled into our head to an extent is we don't, you know, sit back and wait. You, for the most part, you, you know, aggressive, aggression, aggression can sometimes cure some ills, but um, yeah, it's an interesting time. Uh, here's, here's a good question though, uh, that was brought up in the chat. I'm going to ask you this, Matt, first, and then I'll give my opinion. Okay. The impact of crowdsourced drones in comparison to state produced drones and with the context of, the war in Ukraine, obviously, because that you can't ignore that elephant in the room and the mountains of footage that exists of drones smacking into people, oh, tanks, armor, brutal. bridges. I don't know if you saw a Russian bridge got whacked by a, a yes. ML, you know, got whacked by a drone. Uh, 
what do you think? Crowdsource drones versus state drones? Like, what are the what are the pros cons, and what kind of what do you think the future is going to look like with that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. So we got to think about what are we trying to do, right? And I think that the crowdsource drones, first of all, are great because one, they're cheap, right? Right. Two, they're extremely effective. Uh, they're usually hard to spot and identify. Um, We've seen them used for a variety of things, not just necessarily strapping explosives and, and flying them into to buildings, personnel, or dropping mortars or grenades. We've seen them used for spotting and reconnaissance. Yep. So this is something you got to think. I could go to Walmart, pick up a drone, and now I have a real-time asset for my team on the ground to be able to spot enemy movements, to be able to call for uh, direct fire missions. It's It's incredible. Now, when we talk about state drones, uh, things such as, I'm sure you're familiar with the switchblade system that we have, yep. um, these are going to be more of your precision, more long range. Am I trying to hit something that's beyond my current capability of a COTS drone or a conventional off-the-shelf drone or, or a sourced uh, drone? Also, too, um, a different level of, of, of firmware and security that are in those drones, are they going to be less acceptable to... Uh, a counter drone threat, mm -hmm. right? Uh, those are things that I think about. And yeah, man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I got to say, just for a war of attrition, you, you, the crowdsource drones are the way to go, right? Because we can get them in mass numbers. We can do a variety of tasks with them. As most state drones are used for specific tasks, now I have an asset that I can use for multiple tasks. Mm -hmm. Um so until the state drones maybe get on the level of the conventional drones, I think that's kind of the way to go, especially if you are a rebel force or uh, trying to just wreak havoc. I think that's the way to go. And yeah. you can see in these videos, man, absolutely unbelievable to think about something that we thought was going to be great for videos and photography now being used as a instrument of war. Yeah, it's big time. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, for sure. I think my uh, my opinion is sort of very much like you're obviously I agree with everything that you're saying. I think from an actual sourcing perspective, relying, you know, obviously you can't we can't always rely on crowdsourcing for, for drones. You know, I think there's obviously there's a reality is that people get tired of, of war, right? They get tired of um, commitment over time. It's just it's just the nature of things. I think obviously you're not some people aren't going to lose passion nor should they that's not that's not what i'm saying but over time you can't rely on that especially in a war on the scale like people are raising drones right now every single day but from like our perspective the 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 military and the military industrial complex needs to develop a cheap as shit drone that is expendable not necessarily protected against ew not necessarily safe from that just enough to mass produce them and put them in like every squad element enough that you and a Joe could operate a small drone, take out a key target to then assault your position. You know, you don't need a predator for it. You just need a, like you said, a switchblade style drone that is dirt cheap. If it gets shot down, if it gets uh, intercepted electronically, okay. It costs the government a thousand dollars, whatever. That's fine. You get another one. I think that, I think that's the, con that's my concern but also my my why i feel good about it because there's a lot of effort right now uh to make dirt treat dirt cheap drones and put them into the platoon or lower level whether that becomes actual doctrine or not is kind of where i'm like i'm a little bit more nervous because you know how, how long it takes for changes to take place in the military <laughs> however though i will say from a from just seeing some of the doctrine that's coming out some of the, the updated manuals that the uh the army's putting out they are definitely aware of it, and awareness is a good is a good start. <laughs> as long as we know what the risks are, I feel good that we can then start getting to a point where we're, sol we're solving it. But the reality is that industry is going to have to work. They're going to have to work together. We can't we can't tolerate a a large defense company marketing this cheap drone and then you know selling it to the government for five hundred grand a pop. It's just not. It's just not going to work. It's not sustainable. No, uh, it's going to get. It's going to get hacked up by budgets. You know, I, in my mind, a, dr a small drone like that should be like a grenade. Every infantryman carries a grenade, right? Or whatever. They should be carrying a drone that can that can carry that same kind of charge forward. That's that's my opinion. I think it's it's going to be interesting to see. But I think no, that's, the a that's a great take. Yeah, Absolutely. I think I think the I think the mentality is right. 
I think that we're we're on the right track. It's just a matter of speed. And I think, you know, God forbid, yes. again, knock on wood, if it was us in those trenches right now, our families would be sending us drones as well. That is exactly yes. what would be happening. No shit. I also do think, though, that the U.S. government would be rapidly finding a way to <laughs> to field them. And I think they are doing that now, but obviously it's different when it's ours versus theirs. Unfortunately, that's just the reality. But uh, I, I, I think that's a good point. And like Stephen just, just uh, put a comment. He said there's still a way to go in evaluating how well COTS and FPV drones will do in a heavy W environment. Absolutely yes, right. A great point. Ab great point, Stephen. Yeah, and then, but you know, again, like there's a lot of EW right now in Ukraine, and they're targeting the EW platforms with long range fires and and seed and, and all kinds of other things that you know you mitigate you mitigate some of that. Some drones still get through, uh, but it's a good point. But again, that, that kind of goes back to why it has to be dirt cheap. I, I don't want to be upset that I lost a drone to EW when I can just send another one. Or I kind of know where it got down. I can kind of maybe triangulate where the EW attack came from to an extent. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's a lot of speculation, but it's a really good, it's a really good point. It's a really good point. What kind of What kind of training can you tell me a little bit without going to like, obviously going too far into the army doctrine, but like what kind of training from the infantry perspective is being done right now for anti-drone warfare or, or offensive drone warfare? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, um, uh, I think that you kind of brought this out. We are a little bit behind the curve, right? Cause this is still relatively new. Sure. Um, yeah. And we're still kind of learning on the fly. Um, so far, uh, what has been brought into our wheelhouse has mainly been the handheld devices and the drone busters, right? Um, and also, as, as, as far as, as ELPs on the ground, is being vigilant and trying to identify these things before they get into a range that could be detrimental, right? right. Um, we are starting to see a lot more uh, school slots that are opening up for master trainer for UAS. Uh, we know, and this is not uh, anything confidential, but we know that the Raven and the Puma systems have been around for quite some time. Um, and I think for, for a while they've kind of been underutilized in certain elements. Uh, we're starting to see those be utilized more and starting mm -hmm. to get more bodies uh, into those, um, those schools. And just, uh, just recently in, in Kosovo, I mean, we had guys racking up you know, close to 200 flight hours of uh, doing reconnaissance with, with Puma and Raven assets uh, throughout the administrative boundary line. Um, but the counter UAS threat, I think we still got a ways to go. I think that we need to figure out how we're going to combat this on that squad level. Mm -hmm. um, the handhelds, as of right now, are relatively big, bulky. Yeah. Uh, they're they're hard to hard to carry, especially, you know, you got to figure out who's going to carry it, where are you going to put it, right? Um, those are things you have to think about when you're <laughs> coming up with your loadouts, getting ready to roll out on mission. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing that I noticed the most is is most of the things that we have right now are a little bit big and bulky. So I'm I'm hoping that we get some maybe some more sleeker, slimmer type um, <laughs> counter UAS systems uh, into our hands soon. But mm. um, that's kind of where where I've been and where my guys have been so far on training. Yeah, mainly the handheld devices. We well, you know I've seen. Uh, I don't I don't recall the acronym right now, uh, but it's a. I saw a Matt V that had a a special. It's a brand new EW platform that sits on the sits on the back, kind of like our, our kind of like the rest of our equipment. And it was specifically designed to interfere with drones within a certain radius of the vehicle. That was interesting. That's kind of one of those like passive things that we, you know, same with counter ID, trying to intercept those communicate, yes. like, intercept that, that talking Oops and all those things. Right? Yeah. That's, that's something that, I mean, now granted, I imagine that also jams, just depending on the frequency, jams friendly drones. And if it was a commercial drone, you know, damn well, it's going to jam that too. So again, it goes back to like industry and, and the military industrial complex i hate that term you know it, it, it exists i have to acknowledge it it uh, comes back to them you know uh producing a, a cheap drone that is maybe immune to that I yeah it, it, it goes it goes to the modernization of the force right because now we're starting to think long term in future conflicts and i think that there's a there's an initiative going around right now uh, i think 2035 is the target uh with six major uh, modernization steps that the army is looking at and, and that's long range precision fire artillery it's next generation combat vehicles, uh, future vertical lift, the network, air and missile defense, and uh, soldier lethality. Um, so, right. you know, those are things that we have to look at and those systems that we can use that are passive systems that we can put on our uh, vehicles 
uh, or maybe even something that is portable uh, that you could put on in the backpack, right? Yeah. Um, that's something that we have to think about as well that gives you somewhat of a bubble, right? Just something that to where we, we, we have a little bit of a safety net to where we can react and uh, hopefully mitigate the threat as much as possible. But I agree with you. This is something that uh, the military industrial complex is going to have to attack head on, and it's going to have to attack it pretty pretty fast. And yeah. as we've seen time and time again, these videos of Ukraine, absolutely devastating. Um, this is something that is, you know, if you would have talked about this, you know, you know, five, six, seven years ago, man, no one would have really thought it would have been this significant, I, I, th I think. Well, um, you know, to be honest with you, there's still people today that, uh, I mean, my this is an opinion thing, but there, there's still people today that think that this is a fad. This is temporary. I don't think this is temporary. I think this is the new reality from from here on out. Absolutely. I I just don't see how like imagine I mean like, you know, a hardened drone attacking a political event. That that's something that anyone could do relatively easily, you know. Um, and the government obviously, I like we talked about has jamming capabilities, and I'm sure there are capabilities that protect our highest ranking politicians that we don't know anything about. So, but, you know, the average Joe could could grab one of these these mavic drones off off amazon and, and work something that could be at least it could at least hurt people and that itself is is something that is concerning so i i just don't think it's going away i think there's this is this is going to be a new reality and then when we get to ai and then drone swarms which i was playing a video earlier about uh u.s military aircraft that can launch drone swarms that swarm multiple targets at the exact same time i mean like what do you do about that you can try to you try to jam them but Again, if they're hardened, how do you how do you stop that? It's it's crazy, dude. The the future is overwhelming. Yeah, the future is crazy. Although there's a what game is it? Call of Duty. I think it's advanced is it advanced warfare that's in the in the future. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. There's a <laughs> there's a scene where they they launch a I forget the enemy the bad guys. They launch a drone swarm that latches onto the Golden Gate Bridge and then detonate, detonates it. It's crazy. It's a game. It's Call of Duty. It's dumb as shit. Like. It's Call of Duty. It's basically a big Hollywood movie, but that's not that crazy. And that was that was ten years ago, I think, when that game came out. So there's some interesting. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting couple of decades ahead of us. <laughs> no, and you bring up a good point. I mean, yeah, what what we thought was sci-fi or what we think is sci-fi could very well be the future. And I yeah. mean, just the effectiveness of these platforms. I'm telling you, man, and I tell my guys all the time: if you want to see some um my opening footage uh this this war with ukraine by far is the most documented conflict in our recent history and the implementation of these systems has just been absolutely devastating um and i think that that's not something out of the wheelhouse i think right. that's something that's going to continue to move forward because we've just seen how effective they are and also they're they're cheap um they're easy to, to get uh, yeah. and if you're a small rebel group or if you're just a one-man show and you're trying to wreak havoc man <laughs> relatively easy uh, it's kind of like an anarchist cookbook play, man. Uh, you, yeah. you know, buy one at Walmart and strap something to it. It's 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 honestly horrifying. Um, <laughs> it's it's really, it really kind of is. Sad that you know these things that um, were intentionally, uh, or I'm sorry, originally made for for cool things and fun mm -hmm. things are, are now turned into uh, weapons of war. But that's that's human nature, correct? We always yeah. figure out a way to uh, <laughs> make something a weapon. So yeah, no, I, mean, I absolutely agree with you. I think this is a uh, an unnerving future when it comes to this domain. Yeah, um, and I heard you say, uh, I heard you say that you know this is the most documented war in history. But I have it on good authority from Chris sixty nine four twenty of thirty numbers that <laughs> there is no footage of this war and that you are you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So They're absolutely, it's it's all fake. Uh, it's actually an AI CGI. project. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, you know, I think that uh, he's he's got a good point there. Um, we are being, um, you know, played hmm. by the AI menace. Skynet is going to take over. Um, I, I, for one, welcome our robot overlords at this point, dude. I don't. <laughs> well, I mean, it looks like every day that they're, uh, <laughs> it becomes more and more a, a reality every day with the yeah. amount of technology that's being pumped out and the abilities that AI have now is just, yeah, it's unbelievable. It, it's unbelievable. It really is. Um, no man, it's it's uh, it's kind of crazy. But, uh, but no, that's that's interesting. I think it's it's a good chat. Again, that's one that we could probably talk all damn day about. 
but um, for the sake of for the sake of time and like our what some of the things I want we want to talk about, I wanted to pivot real quick to Kosovo. So there was some there was some shenanigans going on there what a couple months ago now, and you yeah, back in May yeah back in May and you recently deployed to Kosovo, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I was there in uh, 22, uh, most of 22. Uh, we got there uh, around late January, early February. And we were uh, in the northern part of Kosovo at a little place uh, called Camp Nothing Hill. Um, and it lives up to its name, ladies and gentlemen. It really does. Um, we're part of a NATO peacekeeping force there, um, patrolling the administrative boundary line uh, that uh, has been in place uh, post the uh, 99 conflict, 98 99 conflict. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that um, air campaign that NATO uh, launched against the uh, uh, Serbian military. Um, so I can tell you right now, uh, the Balkans is a very unique place, and the scars of war um, and ethnic tensions have not faded. Um, it's something that still remains to this day. When uh, when you deployed there, you said it was part of a peacekeeping force. What was what was the day to day? Were you guys actually out in the streets patrolling, or was it more so we're we're here? Don't try anything. Don't be dumb. No, so actually, um, we were patrolling uh, the administrative boundary line. So it's broken up into different uh, districts. We were in control of RC East. Uh, basically, we had a strip of the ABL, uh, which is a fancy word for border, right? But in uh, political terms, Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo as an independent state, and it doesn't recognize it has a border. So we use the administrative boundary line to satisfy both parties. Uh, we were doing patrols with the Kosovo police. We were also doing joint patrols as part of our UN resolution uh, with the Serbian armed forces, uh, basically uh, making sure that uh, freedom of movement for all peoples of Kosovo was being uh, maintained, that uh, there was no illegal trafficking or smuggling operations taking place. Um, you know, Kosovo to this day uh, still very mountainous, remote, uh, switchback trails. It would kind of remind you of, of a of the early days of Afghanistan, right? These little switchback trails or goat trails, as we like to call them, um, where people, you know, over the years, um, whether they've just been commuting back and forth to work, whether they've been going through their homes or whether they're trying to bring uh, illegal goods across the border, uh, these roads are very, very remote. They're very difficult to get to. Um, so we would, a lot of the times, drive to a certain location, dismount, get up to these, do some reconnaissance, take some photos, kind of build a narrative of what's going on in these areas. Um, we also had um, uh, a, quite a large uh, NATO contingent there of uh, Hungarians. Uh, we had the Latvians who worked with the Polish on the regular, uh, NATO partners such as Austria. Um, they were uh, in charge of a more kinetic battalion as far as crowd control and riot control, which we've seen that become a problem throughout the history since Kosovo declared its independence in 2008 with protests and so things of that nature. But primarily our job at Camp Nothing Hill was mainly to patrol, to report, and to make sure that the freedom of movement was being maintained for all the locals. Hmm. Well, so basically it sounds very similar to what happened before, right? Minus the, uh, thankfully, minus the bombing campaign, that wasn't necessary. But like what, when you left, when about were you there, first of all? Maybe you said that and I missed it. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. So uh, we got there at the tail end of uh, January and we left um, at the, I believe, I got back to Texas let's see, around October, late okay. October, October, okay. November time frame. Um, so a good little stint of time over there. Um, and basically, you know, the, <laughs> Kosovo, um, as we know, is primary, primarily um, inhabited by the Albanians. Um, and the Albanians control the government uh, and control the capital of Pristina. The Serbian people make up a minority of the populace, and they're mainly confined to the northern part of the country. What we see to this day is that group of Serbians still do not recognize the sitting government in Pristina. They do not recognize the Albanian-led government. They still recognize the uh, Belgrade government as their government. So simple things uh, when we were there, such as license plates on vehicles, uh, for instance, the Kosovar government was trying to enforce a, a license plate policy to make all of the Serbian um, folks change their license plates on their vehicle. And of course, they were like, no, we're not going to change our license plates. 
So that ended up being a uh, blockade of the road to the northern part of the country for several weeks uh, where, you know, no movement was taking place. Uh, and that's kind of what we've seen um, mostly is these roadblocks, and they do multiple roadblocks. They're very well coordinated uh, with dump trucks, buses. Um, we've even seen some armed individuals around these roadblocks. But most recently, we had a clash um, with NATO peacekeepers and ethnic Serbs over a dispute over recent elections that took place. And basically, to sum that up, uh, Belgrade had insisted that the Serbs boycott the upcoming elections. Um, and the result of that was ethnic Albanians were uh, elected mayor in certain um, Serbian-dominated municipalities in northern um, Kosovo. I almost said Syria because I'm so used to talking about it. No, when you said RC East, I was like, what? <laughs> one of those things. And so that led to them saying, well, hey, these elections are, uh, are not legitimate. We're not going to recognize these uh, Albanian mayors. And as you can see, that led to a lot of violence. Uh, we're talking roughly uh, 70 peacekeepers were injured. Some had to be airlifted out. Wow. Uh, we've seen the use of incendiary devices such as Molotov cocktails, some improvised pipe bombs, um, and there was even some, some reports of uh, a small gunshot wounds. So mm. this was something that could have easily escalated into a regional conflict. You immediately seen a response from Belgrade with its largest military posturing since the war on the border, uh, deploying long-range artillery assets, armored assets, infantry assets, and at sometimes, you know, threatening to, to come across and, you know, deal with the situation themselves. Now, this is not something that Belgrade wants to do. Uh, they don't want to get into a direct conflict with NATO. A lot of, of the times it's all about posturing, right? It's all about perception. And we've seen this time and time again from the, uh, the Belgrade playbook. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to think that I'm biased in, in saying this. I'm, I'm just kind of giving you the, the overall situation as, as it stands. But this is something that we are relatively used to as, as soldiers on the ground. Uh, when something happens, it's usually uh, a minor protest with no injuries, no conflict. It's a road blockade. But in this scenario, uh, you had NATO peacekeepers being injured and assaulted and attacked. And as you can see from those videos, it was uh, a pretty significant event that could have, um, you know, boiled over into a more, uh, you know, regional response. As it stands currently, um, I also ref I refer to that meme of the Spider-Man, right, with everybody that has the, 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 finger, the finger guns pointed at each other. <laughs> it's really tense. It's really tense. And I, I, I kind of got to say, I, I kind of feel that a lot of the times the, the Serbs that are, that are in the north are, are almost used, um, you know, for uh, a horse and pony show. It's really, really sad to see. Oh, absolutely. And just recently, this video that you're showing now, was a, an attack on Kosovo police at a monastery in the northern part of the country that led to the death of a police officer. Uh, the police did engage uh, some armed men. Uh, I believe that three or four of those individuals were killed. Um, it was then later found out this was part of a group called the Serbian List, which is a ultranationalist group that we believe um, is being trained and armed by the Serbians uh, to pretty much... I guess you could say uh, be henchmen, right, for mm. interests of Belgrade, nonchalant. Um, so it's still a conflict that does have the um, ability to continue to destabilize Eastern Europe. Um, and again, you know, Kosovo is still not recognized by quite a few uh, major players, such as Russia, China. Of course. Um, and also, too, they're, they're really trying to get EU membership, and this is something that dates back to this Brussels agreement in 2013. You know, ultimately, um, they wanted to create municipalities that would be governed uh, by Serbian ethnics and also that, that the, you know, the, the Serbian government would have more control over. Those still haven't been implemented successfully. And so a lot of the Serbian uh, nationals in the north – are very, very upset, and they just feel that they're pretty much a pawn in a chess game, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, they're not wrong, that, right? <laughs> exactly, and, and I do feel for them. You know, I do feel for them in that aspect. I can only imagine what they go through. Life is very hard in Kosovo for both parties. Uh, we're talking about people that are making sometimes a 200 to 300 euro a month, and this is what they're living off of. Yeah. Uh, so you do have, you know, extreme poverty in the country. Uh, the... The municipalities are not the best. 
Um, there's a lot of problems. So this is something that we have to think about long term. If NATO, hypothetically, was to pull out of the region, we know that uh, for a fact that the Serbians would roll across the border very, very soon, right? Yeah. Um, I often thought about this multiple times. You know, what is the purpose here long term? Ultimately, it's to keep stability. It's to keep relations on somewhat of a norm, continue to go to Brussels to try to find a diplomatic solution, to implement policies of the Brussels Agreement. And ultimately, can we give both of these states EU membership? That's something that they both want. Um, I don't know what the solution is going to be. I mean, this is something that's been going on, I mean, since 1998. Um, it's a very, very difficult situation. There's a lot of complexities to this, especially when you talk to both local Albanian and local Serbians. And then once you're on the ground and see it first person, there's not just a magic wand that you can go to erase, you know, 30 plus years of, of tensions. And it's something that we have to uh, be cognizant about. And hopefully this doesn't eventually, you know, broaden a, a conflict in Europe, which is something that nobody wants. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I think, you know, if Russia wasn't bogged down in a very large campaign in Ukraine right now, they may be putting more pressure in, in, in that part of the world but at the same time. I, I don't know really what there's such a significant NATO presence in Kosovo and the first time, you know, that did not go the way that Serbia probably would have wanted it to go. <laughs> I, I think they're aware of that. And they know that, like you said, it's the same with Iran. Like they don't actually want to fight us. They just, they want no. to make, put as much pressure as possible. And then maybe, maybe the, the difference on the like polit politics will change, you know, maybe some elected official will come in and say, I'm, I'm not, supporting that country anymore and then others in the alliance are like eh, well, you know i i don't know I, I don't think that would happen i think i think there are plenty of nations within nato that are very steadfast in the support of the of the alliance and and kosovo in this case so uh but it is it is something i mean again we got we have this we have israel and palestine we have um constant tensions in, in obviously south china sea that's just that's always going on and then we had that brief almost sounded like a ma major war going to happen in africa that was being pushed from all sides just from all kinds of actors and honestly i haven't checked back in on what what's actually happening in africa lately i've been you know admittedly pretty distracted by other things but i'm curious if there's you... a lot to take in yeah <laughs> yeah there's I'm, a I'm... lot to take in brother. yeah it's just it just it does seem like it's just a, across the board there's a lot there's a lot of stuff going on and um we're in this weird period of time where for whatever reason multiple multiple adversaries are testing the limits of american and western power you know I think they're going to keep pushing that as much as they possibly can. I think to an extent it's, it's, it's like you said, it's posturing, I, but it's something to keep an eye on. You know, I, I don't know. I'm looking at uh, the question here. Do you think Kosovo will become an independent country? If yes, what would be best and most calmest process to do that? I mean, they just need to be recognized, right? I mean, there's major players that have not recognized them and they probably never will. I mean, I don't, I don't see Russia ever recognizing Kosovo. I, ever, I ever, don't ever. think – yes, and, and that is a great question. I think basically the pressure on Belgrade from the Kremlin will, will always be – if you recognize Kosovo, it's another win for NATO expansion. It's always right. that NATO expansion in their mindset. Um, you know, I, I, I really hope that one day it is recognized, but I also hope that both parties are equally represented. What we have to understand is – both of these individuals that are – I'm sorry, both of these ethnicities that are, are in the country, the Serbians and the, the Albanians, they are different in a lot of ways. However, there are solutions to those, right? Diplom diplomacy time and time again has proved that it can work uh, and that it is effective, and obviously that is what we want to do. Right. Um, so NATO being there um, is is hopefully going to continue that process, right, of, 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 of keeping the peace – Making sure that that movement for all peoples of Kosovo is is continuing um, on a day to day basis, and um, yeah, I think that ultimately we're going to have to see the implementation of the Serbian municipalities, right, of the original agreement in Brussels from 2013. We're going to have to see Serbian um, appointed officials governing over those areas as well, mm. um, and 
ultimately, uh, the Albanians are going to have to understand that that is the only way that they're probably going to achieve um, a, a, a normalcy in relations with the Serbians. Um, I, I can tell you this, multiple people that I've talked to in Serbia, uh, we would be, you know, doing checkpoints or we would just be doing observation posts. And, you know, I had the pleasure of talking to a lot of locals. Right. I can tell you this with, 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 with certainty. A lot of them do not hate the United States. They don't hate us. They simply just want to live their lives just like we would. Right. Um, mas- basically, a lot of their viewpoints are, hey, we just want to be Serbian, right? We just want to be left alone. We want to live our lives. We kind of feel like we've been caught in, in, in a quote-unquote autonomous zone for so many years. Um, and I can understand that. And, of course, the Albanians are also afraid that, you know, if anything ever happened to, to, to NATO or if we ever pulled out of, of the region – that it would be another uh, catastrophe in, in a conflict that would claim the lives of thousands on both sides. Mm-hmm. So I think that in ult- ultimately to, to ensure peace and, and to get them recognized, we're going to have to take those steps and make those things happen. But unfortunately, like you pointed out earlier, in the greater scheme of things with the Kremlin ultimately having the final say of what Belgrade's going to do, I don't think that's possible anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and also, too, with the with – the, um, Temptation of EU membership, right? That mm-hmm. both countries want. Uh, that's another option. Hopefully, um, that we can try to facilitate more talks um, to to get these things rolling. But it's a very, very complex situation. It's a very delicate situation. It's it's very confusing, right? Unless you actually kind of dive into the history and kind of see what's going on. I, I can tell you right now, probably most Americans couldn't tell you where Kosovo is on a map. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna it, I'm gonna Google it. Let's see how many people have asked this question. Okay. Okay. Where is Kosovo located? This is pops right up. That's a prediction. Where is Kosovo? What country? That, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> hold on. Wait. I need to go to Google, Google though. Google is the. Let's see what. Let's see what happens. I. I'm just gonna put where Kosovo located on the world I like map. That. Kosovo. Where is this country? Kosovo. Where to go? It in the world. Where to visit? It. Where is it on the map? Where to eat? Okay. So every other question is, where can I go to visit? Which is nice. That's good. There's tourism. And then the other questions are, where the, where the hell is Kosovo? So, <laughs> I mean, that, that's about, that's about normal. But like, like I always say, like the one thing I'm getting, I get really, really irritated by, and people who follow me on Twitter will say the same thing. I really, really hate when people will not just say, I don't know. You can just say, I don't know. Like I have blind spots. I don't know that much about, I know enough about Sovio, uh, Kosovo, Sovio. Good Lord. Kosovo <laughs> and Serbia. I know enough. <laughs> Shut the hell up. Anyway, I know enough Love to it. like have this conversation and talk with you about it because I know enough about it. I am no expert on the nitty gritty of what's going on in the politics there. I know about the NATO stuff. I know about 1999. I know that, but like I'm not an expert. I would never. I just can't speak that intelligently about it. But it's good to. It. It seems like you really have a. Obviously, you were there, so. It's good that you kind of know. That's what we did, though. That's what we did before we deployed. We would we would learn about where we were going. We learn about the people. We learn about what was their what was their concern. I think a lot of people picture the the military and especially the U.S. military as just this like monolith of um, uncaring dipshits who just want to take over and steal oil and all that other shit. But the reality was like how Someone much say oil. I know, <laughs> of course, the oil. But like the reality is like how much tra- how much time do we spend in, in training like cultural aware- cultural awareness and language and how to make sure we weren't offending like the women and like and and to there's a lot of that there's a lot of that that happens but that's here nor there. I'm going on a, on a tangent. Anyway, I just wish more people would say they don't know what the hell they're talking about. It would make the internet so much easier. It just you're exactly right. Just say so exactly you don't know. Right. And and I gotta say on, on both sides, I, I had some amazing interactions. Um, when I got to work with the Serbian Armed Forces, uh, I had some amazing interactions with them. I really got to learn their viewpoints, uh, a little bit of their culture. Um, a lot of them were like, "Hey, we would love for you guys to to come to Belgrade, you know, or right. we'd love you for you guys to come visit, uh, you know." And then of course talking to the Kosovars, the same thing, you know, come to Pristina, you know, thank you guys for being here, blah 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 blah. So at the end of the day, they're all human beings. They're all trying to live their lives. Unfortunately, most of them are caught in a conflict that's beyond them. It's in a, a large geopolitical scheme, um, and that's the sad part. And you're right. Um, you know, it, we're not always the, the 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 empire and the Death Star coming through to laser beam someone off the map. Uh, a lot of the times, I can tell you right now, as being a Joe on the ground, I genuinely care about what happens to those people, just like <laughs> I genuinely care about what happened to the people in Syria and our Kurdish yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, it's something that I think about daily. It's something that um, I hope that gets better with time. 
Uh, but unfortunately, with given the geopolitical stage that we're on, with the amount of conflicts and the complexity complexities of that, um, it's not looking too good currently. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about the simplicity of going back and knowing a state actor is your is your adversary. At least there's some simplicity to that, right? But uh, yes. Um, in the in answer to the question about the worst kind of scenario for Kosovo, I think Matt already hit on that. That would be a withdrawal of all support from NATO or anyone else, the EU included, and basically allowing it to be absorbed. And I think that would be their worst case scenario for them. Worst case um, scenario, absolutely. Yeah, I, I still um, think it's it, a long shot, but it'd be it'd be the you know pretty rough. Yeah, and the only thing that, that I could second on that would probably be an engagement between sure. Serbian armed forces and NATO personnel, which I highly doubt that that would ever take place or ever happen. Um, yeah. But that would be another um, no, regional conflict that would spiral out of control relatively quickly. Yeah, that would be really – like I said, even if even if the U.S. itself was like, no, we're not going to respond to whatever – I think I think the U.K. – I think the U.K. is there right now too, right? I saw them patrolling the other yes. day. So a lot of uh, – you got a lot of hands in that pot. And yeah. I can tell you right now too, uh, going into the next year, uh, the United Kingdom along with other – several other uh, NATO partners and, and allies have um, – specifically said that they're going to increase their posture and increase their force and their presence in uh, the K4, which is what we're called, Kosovo Force, K4, um, into Kosovo. Uh, the British, uh, there's uh, several videos that's floating around the internet right now of a larger British contingent that's on the ground. Um, we worked with the Polish quite frequently, quite frequently, and I see aloha from Poland. I love you guys. I hope you're doing well. Oh, yeah. Good old Poland. hope you're staying warm over there. I absolutely love the Polish. I got some great photos. I got to shoot their weapon systems up at the range. Great group of guys. Um, but yeah, so, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, European partners over there that are, are really picking up the slack and, and, and doing work. And I, I can tell you this too. It's really good to see that because having those individuals and having those countries over there, that's their area, right? right. They can relate better. Uh, and it's always great having them there and being a part of that. And it brings a, another level of diplomacy, right? Um, uh, to, to the table, which is, is great for that region. Yeah, it's a good. It's another good. Um, it's another good little segue since uh, since Gladio mentioned Poland. Uh, we were talking earlier about the title of this episode again is the future of warfare tactics and lessons learned. We hit on that really early on with the drone stuff, but I think from a macro perspective, I'm kind of curious what you think about this. There's been a lot of like for years and years and years, the U.S. admittedly has kind of push back against the idea of a of an independent european military force not necessarily an eu army but that's essentially what it is and i kind of agreed for a long period of time but with the way with the way things have been going on a macro on a macro level i don't think the u.s power i don't think u.s power is going anywhere it is being challenged and you know we do have adversaries that are strengthening at least one is strengthening for the kind of sort of um, if, if shit hits the fan, there's a very realistic chance that the U S would be, would be really struggling to fight a two front war. I mean, I, we've done it. We've correct. done it before. I know we've done it before. This is different. It's a different ball game right now. You know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very much not 1939, 1945. It's just not. So there's been a lot of talk like, like Poland's a great example. Poland has been buying like a crazy amount of military gear they're buying k2s from panther k2 panthers from korea south korea m1 abrams for us and then like helicopter like a lot of stuff uh germany i think is finally starting to talk about increasing their defense spending and getting their readiness levels back up to par because they've not been up to par for years so i guess my broad my, my broad segue that i'm going to lead you into is one u.s fighting on two fronts one is that wise or smart, and then two, what are the thoughts of like a, an independent European military force? Yeah, Let's two great questions. That. Well, yeah, so a two front war, uh, we know, is a very very difficult thing to to handle uh, logistically, uh, manpower. Um, it's something that um, is going to take away a little bit from your combat power as an overall collective, right? Because now we're having to distribute the workload, we're having to distribute assets, right? Um, I think that in modern day, uh, with a near peer adversary, it's going to be very, very difficult. And this is something that we're going to have to rely heavily upon our NATO partners and allies. I think Poland has proven uh, that they are more than capable of the job. 
Um, as you can see, their military is, is top-notch. Um, they have the same ideals. They have the same views, for the most part, uh, as we do on the geopolitical front. Um, and, and I think that it's a great thing for them to, to bolster and to uh, empower themselves. And, and I think that that's ultimately what it's going to take. One, um, I'm a big peace through strength type of guy, right? Deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. This is how we deter aggression. Um, and I think that you've seen just recently with the, um, the parades and, and the war um, that we're starting to see kind of like that um, revival of that, you know, European pride, right? And uh, I think that's going to be something that's going to, to help us, God forbid, in a multi-front near-peer war in the future. I'm trying to think of how to phrase this politically. <laughs> I I personally, regardless of some politicians' statements about you know NATO withdrawal and all this other shit, I may maybe I'm like too much of an optimist, but like realistically, I don't I don't see that actually happening. I think I think even the most extreme of politicians that may or may not be in the running for president right now understand that. The U.S., though it is the "quote unquote" premier military power on earth, you know, by pretty much every metric, we still need allies because allies Absolutely. allies are are by far what make uh, what makes the U.S. a superpower. That's what people don't really understand. Like, yeah, we can count tanks, we can count jets, doesn't matter. We have the largest alliance network in the world. But that's where I kind of that's where my like my concern comes into play. The U.S. I think that we ourselves need to be able to pick a theater and say we are. We'll we'll assist elsewhere. God forbid something happens, but in a place like Europe, there are way too many powerful militaries with smart smart leaders, um, capable machinery and equipment, and and jets and tanks that we we should be able to um, you know let them have this this independent military force. And I'm hoping that that's kind of where things are going. You know, I think a lot of them are. are I've seen some recent statements basically saying that. The reason they're doing that is because they doubt that the U.S. is going to be committed to their defense. I'm not even sure if that's really the concern they should have. I mean, the end result is the same. They take over more of their own defense. That's the end result. I think that the rea the reality is that if we are, God forbid, it shouldn't happen. I hope it never does. But if we're in a war in the Pacific and it's it's going longer than expected, because that's usually what happens with, with wars, that we need to be able to take hands off, you know, germany and and poland i'm not as worried about but you know we should be supporting poland regardless but 100 percent. yeah i guess especially the, the, the border countries need definitely need attention right this is something right. and, and throughout polish history we've seen um they definitely need to uh to bolster themselves and posture themselves um, yeah. to deter um and, uh, and yes and, and to kind of caveat off what you said uh, we can't always be the world police right correct. and what i mean by that is we can't be everywhere at once now, like you said, we will help. We will assist. However, there's going to be, if in the event of a major uh, conflict, um, you know, multi-domain, uh, near-peer, multi-front conflict, you're yeah. going to have to rely heavily on Europe to 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 take the brunt of that front. And also, too, like you said, having partners and having allies is great because that's what allows us to position ourselves. That's what allows us to have the logistics that we have. You got to think. Being able to deploy uh, uh, the force forces within 42 to 78 hours anywhere uh, – I'm sorry, 40, 48 to 72 hours anywhere in the world mm -hmm. is a feat of strength. But it's not something that we can just do alone, right? That's why we have such a, a broad network of being able to uh, have that access to, the, to our partner states right. to use places for naval landings, you know, to land cargo, to land aircraft, to move troops via rail, via highway. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, the the one question I saw here was, uh, what do we think about Finland joining NATO? I was extremely excited when Finland joined NATO. Um, As was I. As I mean, that, that I. is a thirteen hundred kilometer new border with Russia with NATO. That was not in their plan. I don't care. You can tell me, <laughs> you can tell me anything you want. That was not their plan, and there's no way it was. Finland itself, obviously, is it's obviously way smaller, right? It's got much less population it's 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 a small country but history has shown that they are very very capable i think we have a lot to learn from them when it comes very to resilient. Very, very resilient very resilient people um we have a lot to learn from them ourselves when it comes to arctic warfare obviously we have 
you know, we have bases in Alaska and, you know, we have Canada where we train with all the time, but still we, we have a lot to learn from them in the Arctic. I think that they can take a, our, or they can take a, an increased role, um, keeping an eye on the Arctic because, you know, I've been talking a lot lately. This is going to be controversial. Global warming is we happening. Love controversy. We right. love controversy. Global warming is happening. I, whether, how it's happening, whatever there, the science, they, there are, there's melting in the ice caps right now, right? I don't know what's causing it. Let's just say I have no idea. There are shipping lanes opening up in the Arctic right now. There are new trade routes and routes for submarines and sh naval ships, uh, military ships opening up in the Arctic right now. No matter your politics, that's it's your politics don't matter, right? Um, countries like Canada and Finland and Sweden and all those in the Arctic, like Norway, they all have this this uh, ability to really make the Arctic you know, stronger and help us do that. And, you know, we have, what is it? One icebreaker, I think. Um, yeah, I believe we do have one. Yeah. Canada um, has a cup. Canada has a couple. I think Russia has like 16. That's one thing that they are. Russia is their NATO their I'm sorry, their NATO, their Arctic policy is, is pretty, um, it's pretty pointed. You know, I, 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 that's my take. I don't, I don't know if that's true. It could be, it could be the same, um, the way I've interpreted years ago when we were briefing troops on near peer conflict, and we were like, Hey, Russia is back as a near peer threat. We need to take it seriously. China's coming up as a near peer or is a near peer to peer threat. We need to take it seriously. Given the last like year or two, um kind of iffy on the near peer stuff right now. <laughs> maybe maybe from a <laughs> nuclear sense, but like I, I don't know, man. Maybe it's just pure yeah. hubris, but hubris. I I just I don't see them performing well against 10th mountain or 101st to be honest with you but that's that's a whole other conversation but the long story short is i'm, I'm really i'm really happy that finland's in i think that they too. have a lot to offer and uh anyway go ahead dude I, I, i've been rambling for no, a while i i love your rambling it, <laughs> it does my heart joy when you ramble don't flatter um, me because i can then use the key phrase of caveat or caveat off mm, of what you said to this piggyback, piggyback off of what the commander said here ladies i'm gonna reach through this really and strangle you dog. You gotta walk that dog, lady. Oh my god, I no, forgot no. about that one. Oh, <laughs> Finland. Anyway. Oh man, just so much history, and um, we're very resilient people. Uh, great, great, great partner uh, to have, mm -hmm. um, and they are going to help increase that capability, right? Yeah. And um, and like you said too, as far as training, that's some great country, right? Yeah. <laughs> to get that Arctic training in and to collaborate with. Um, I've seen some some Finnish uh, come to some JRTC rotations and NTC rotations. Um, it's really good to see those guys come through and, and collaborate with them. Uh, I think it was the right move, the right call. I was kind of curious uh, with the whole thing with, with Turkey kind of holding up that ball for a minute. But, yeah. um, you know, ultimately, I think it was one of those things that was going to happen regardless, right? Same with Sweden, um, to be honest. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's just a matter it's, it's of happen. politics. And I think that what we see now is that a lot of these countries are understanding Ukraine really opened the eyes of a lot of, I think, European states. It, it really did. I, I, I think that conflict on this scale in Europe, modern day, was the un, unimaginable, right? It was the unthinkable. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're talking about how, you know, Russia and China being near peer and holding up, you can see just with a collective coalition that came together with funding, resources, materials, equipment, we've been able to take a force such as Ukraine and you know, magnify their combat power, right, um, and pretty much ramp them up to become uh, the same caliber or, or, or near uh, what a, you know, a, a U.S. troop would be or, or a NATO troop would be. So uh, it's, it's, it, there's power in that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and what they've been able to do to the, to the Russian advance has just been phenomenal. Because I, I can tell you right now, most people thought that it was going to be a five-day war. It was going to be a steamroll. Millie included. They push right to Kiev Ky and – and Vladimir Putin would have been the next day, you know, on a, on a podium with a big Russian flag. Uh, and that simply wasn't the case. Um, and it's still not the case. Um, and, and now, unfortunately, we are seeing scenes that of the First World War with this positional trench warfare. Um, where they've, they've kind of dug that hard line. And it's, it's more of meters or miles being gained or, or back and forth. Mm -hmm. But that is just this shows you the sheer capability of having a coalition that's like-minded, being able to support and uh, sustain an operation like that so and it did it did expose it did expose a lot of cracks though in that coalition not like not necessarily yeah, from did. a not necessarily from a, even it from did. a willpower perspective but 
again, like the German military readiness, like they themselves have said, our readiness is dog shit. Um, we knew that back back a decade ago when when they showed up to training without machine guns and they put like brooms in the tank turrets. And I heard that that was, I heard that was nonsense. But I also heard from people who were there like, yeah, no shit, dude. They had brooms in the in the in the turrets because they were just trying to simulate. Which is I get like we've done silly shit like that before because we didn't have what we needed. But they again they themselves are, are very concerned about their own military readiness. So I think you know Germany, France, the UK, all these these big military powers in europe have i think they're i think they're realizing that um regardless of the fact that the russian military isn't necessarily professional in the same way we would we would describe it it could still inflict a lot of pain and a lot of damage on an unprepared country they may not they may not win but what does it matter if you know cities are burnt and and you know thousands of your people are dead it doesn't matter and someone earlier in the chat you know like you brought up deterrence deterrence is great and like you kind of hinted at it's kind of useless to an extent if you don't use it to another extent, you know, like you have to Absolutely. use it, you have to use it. Sometimes you have to use it intelligently. Obviously the nuclear deterrence is the biggest we got, but you know, three or four F 15 attacks on some bases that are launching 90 to hundred attacks on us bases. Is that really equivalent? Eh, probably not. Probably if, not. Yeah, if we drop if we dropped a Moab on on the middle of a major command center in, on the Houthis headquarters, would that maybe tell them that they should maybe stop? Maybe, <laughs> you know. Maybe. Um, um, yeah, I don't it know. Reminds me of the <laughs> last one being dropped in Afghanistan. Um, oh yeah. Tunnel network. Um, yeah. You know that's that's Oof. a that's a real wake up call to show you the combat power that we have. Um, and I agree with you completely. You you, you sometimes, um, in the, in the case kind of circling back to Syria think we need to get a little bit more kinetic yes right? a little bit more hands-on yes. and you know ladies and gentlemen we have some very very skilled individuals uh and assets in that region that are um it's like a dog on a leash right we gotta we gotta uh, take the leash off sometimes if you, if you go in you, you grab some people or you, you do a, a, a kinetic raid or or something that's a, a big attention grabber that can that can you know deter um but yeah that's a great point that um uh, our uh, viewer made here was that if you if you have the deterrence and don't use it, what's the point? Well, what's, it's what's it's the freaking point. Half of it was um, that escalation, you know, escalation stuff is well. If we do this, then it's going to make things worse, which by itself is not an incorrect line of thinking necessarily. Mm -hmm. But like you said, if you if you bite me and I bite you back, I I don't know what what you can really truly say. And especially sometimes if you bite back a little bit harder, it shows like you stop, just stop what you're doing. Yes, There's... that's basically you got to bite back a little bit harder than they bit you, right? And, and and that's in hopes that that kind of puts a simmer, right? Or that kind of tones it down. And and we know that when we're, we know proxies, we know terrorist organizations, they don't have any limits, right? right. They, they 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 tend to keep keep going, but we can severely damage, we can severely degrade, we can severely uh, hinder their operations to make them almost obsolete, as we've seen, case in right. point, with IS, right? Um, and even it, going back to the Afghanistan days, you know, the Taliban was was defeated at one point. When you think about the early days of the Afghanistan, it, we kind of showed the combat power that we had going in and being able to completely push people out of an area, right? Right. Um, and that's a whole other can of worms. I don't want to open it up. I'm just, trying to <laughs> yes. use, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, use certain examples. Sure. No, we yeah. have that ability, right? We've seen that ability be used multiple times. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is something that we're going to have to really think about. The Pentagon needs to wake up and maybe really think about some of these um, um, issues that we've talked about yeah. um, and how we're going to move forward. But, yeah, um, no, um, yeah, I don't know, man. No, just to, not to cut you off. I'm sorry, but a uh, good point was made in chat. Like, was, did the Europeans do anything without U.S. C2 and logistics versus Libya? I don't I don't know. I know like Europe as a collective does have a lot of logistics capability. I still think that we're by far clearly – ahead when it comes to logistics capabilities heavy lift everything that you can possibly imagine i know i know yeah. like europe obviously has a great train network that spreads all across which is which is important you know i mean being able, to, being able to train troops from or like literally train troops from you know western europe to eastern europe would is pretty quick and you know it'd be hard to hit that kind of target deep within germany itself if you are an adversary so they do have some logistics networks but as for transport aircraft and all that i i don't think they i don't i don't know the numbers but 
you know, if you, if you, again, it's kind of a trap though, assuming Europe is one entity when it's not, it's really, it's really not. It's the EU. It's really yeah. It's yeah. Collective. Yeah. And I think that's, it's kind of a trap because like Germany may do one thing. That doesn't mean that France will do it. They might, but you know, Germany has 30, let's say they have 30 C one thirties and France has 30 C one thirties. Germany may only be able to deploy 20 and France is like, yeah, we'll send you five. It's not, you can't really like apply it equally, but I, I would like to see, I would like to see Europe as a collective be close to, if not on, on par with the U S as far as defense spending goes, that's not probably not going to happen in our lifetime, barring some yeah. major, some major geopolitical event that means that you and I are both back on the front somewhere. Unfortunately, I think that's uh, the unfortunately, reality. You know, it, you know, you think about GDPs too, right? Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of factors. We, we know for we know that that small smaller countries are not going to be able to to you know put up the the funding that mm-hmm. that obviously we do and, and other countries do. But it's it's if we can get that collective right that uni- unity of being able to do the onesie twosie hey I can do this I can do that you know that's ultimately um, uh, what what I'd like to see more of yeah and that, you know that that kind of bolsters your power as when you work as a collective um, true and, and hopefully and, and targeting waste you know even though we are the biggest military spender you and I both yeah. know that we we spend money on things we don't need to you know and we could Absolutely. we could easily spend money smarter. And I think that's, I agree. I think you and I are, you and I are, again, there's this perception that Americans are really, 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 really like, I don't know, dumb when it comes to our, our own, I guess, analyzing ourselves. But I like to think that at least from you and I, we know our weaknesses. We know we can do better in a lot of things and we need to do better in a lot of things. So, and I, and I want our friends and allies to be peers and they are, they are peers. Don't get me wrong, but I want them to be true peers. And I think, um, you know, Europe has a lot of ben- benefits that they do some things better than we do. And I think we could learn. And I think vice versa. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for a lot of, there's a lot of things going on right now that um, are really, really positive. Uh, France and Germany are cooperating on a lot of things that they weren't really before. And like you said, Ukraine kind of supercharged it. So it's, yeah, it's going to be, that. it's going to be interesting to see, but it's all about execution, man. Cause execution the, implementation. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the war could end tomorrow. And we have peace for five to ten years, and we're right back where we started. You know, people get complacent. Um, we do. Uh, you know, unfortunately, in what we're seeing uh, right now, case in point, is when we when we think about the grand scheme of things, we're talking about nuclear deterrence, and and ultimately, we know that that's the kind of the final ultimatum overall with a uh, conflict between, uh, you know, uh, right. a NATO versus Russia scenario, which we never want. But um, you know. And I just lost my train of thought because ADHD really, really does suck, ladies and gentlemen. No, it's because I'm rambling. Uh, it's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but um, I guess what I was trying to say is basically we we, we don't want to go down that road. What we're seeing now, oh, there it is, is a lot of proxy, a lot of proxy warfare, right? Proxy warfare has kind of been the the, the, the modern warfare that we've seen um, over the last uh, decade or so. And I think that that's mainly going to be the future uh, for the foreseeable future is a continuation of, of proxy warfare because at the end of the day, everyone knows like, hey, if we if we go past that, we know what lies beyond, right? That's mm-hmm. what not, that nobody wants. However, at the end of the day, we always have to be prepared for all scenarios, right? Yep. Um, and so once again, peace through strength, deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. Hopefully uh, that never comes to that, but, you know, we got to prepare. Always prepare for the worst. Yeah, man. It's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. That is um, true. And one little thing, is, and I know we're kind of rambling at this point, but when you were talking about collaboration between us and our NATO partners, mm-hmm. you know, one thing that I often talk about that I've seen mainly that's a problem within the command structure of, for instance, the Russian military, is the implement or the underutilization of the NCO Corps. The NCO Corps for the United States Army and the United States military in general is absolutely essential to day-to-day operations, and it also creates a another layer of what we call decentralized command of NCOs being trained and being capable of making real-time decisions on the battlefield. Well, not always have to having a, an officer or um, you know a, a command team saying, "Hey, I need you to go do this A, B, and C." Right? You give an objective. Hey, I need to take Hill 137. All right, take the hill. Well, when I get on the ground, I can assess the situation and in real time make a decision on what's best given the data, right, uh, to, to, to take that hill. And that's something that I notice, um, you know, working with the uh, alongside Serbian Armed Forces, which is pretty much a, a mirror image of 
uh, the former Yugoslavian army and Soviet army and Soviet tactics, Soviet doctrine. Mm -hmm. They even admitted it themselves. We were leading patrols with E-5s and E-6s. You know, the United States Army is E-6 driven when it comes down to conducting missions. Most Amen. of our missions are, are, are driven by that E-6, that, that squad leader, that staff sergeant, or that young E-5 team leader that's Amen. taking command and control of his guys. I'm not downplaying officers. Uh, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> you better not. Uh, uh, exactly, sir. <laughs> Just no, kidding. No, but uh, ultimately what I'm trying to say is I think this is something that a lot of European countries are looking at as well. Mm -hmm. How do we utilize these NCOs better to become more effective on the battlefield? Um, and this is something, like I said, that I've seen firsthand with the Serbians, and the Serbians even talked about, like, you know, um, the NCO rank or the sergeant rank doesn't hold the same power equivalents uh, that it does compared to the United States military. And I was kind of curious what your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually uh... – I'm right there with you. Obviously, you know me. I'm I I was never at least I don't think I was one of those kinds of officers. But hey, you're right. NCOs are the ones that are going to win the you wars. <laughs> no, no, you I, were great. You were great. Uh, no, shut up. But uh, the, the the like you said, Russia, uh, Russia, China, a lot of those autocratic countries they have the same problem that they have politically, where they put all the power in one guy. Russia, it's Putin, right? Uh, there's argument. There's there was a comment by a politician from the State Duma who said. Literally, Putin is Russia. And that mentality has been like, that's been a thing for so long now. And it for sure extends to their military because they can't do, sh I mean, that's why they, the Russia lost like 15 general officers because they were all at the front micromanaging the shit out of their forces. That And, and that's why not only were they getting killed easily because they were getting targeted, but Russia was, it cannot, it just seems incapable of launching like, and it seems incapable of offensive actions that don't involve high casualties. And I think they don't, they don't have the ability to improvise. And I think that's really, really, really starting to show. And there are a lot of Ukrainians I talked to, um, I've, I've kind of dealt like chatted here and there. And I went, I trained with a Ukrainian officer in engineer school and he, he used to say the same thing, like full disclosure, like a lot of their, a lot of their tactic, not tactics, but a lot of their structure is still very Soviet in its, in its origins. And a lot of what they've been trying to do now is, adopt get a new mentality to how they structure their forces get that old nco mentality in there and there was a fantastic video i did a podcast on it from the uh what was it the 47th brigade and this this one dude he used to be an apparently he used to be an officer may have gotten it's a ukrainian soldier may have gotten in trouble was now an nco and he's in the trenches just like dude it is pure e6 shit he he knows exactly what he's doing there's an officer there who's very much he seems very green a little bit new and he's like sir i'm not gonna tell you what to do but i'm doing this and then he goes and i was like oh my god that reminds me of something you know what i mean yes. so they're definitely picking up on it I, I i haven't seen anything i don't know if anyone's truly dug into it but structurally i don't think russia's made any changes to how they how their nco core works i don't think they truly have quote unquote an nco core like you and i think about it Yes, um, I don't think so either. And, yeah. and that's another thing too. When you think about institutions as far as within within the organization, um, the NCO Academy, right? We yeah. think about. Um, um, I know it gets gets a little boring. Some people don't understand what I'm saying, but CLC, ALC, SLC, and what these are, ladies and gentlemen, are are schools for the rank that you hold. For instance, when a when a young specialist or corporal that's getting ready to be promoted to E5 sergeant to be uh, an acting team leader. Um, he or she are, are going to go to the basic leadership course where they're going to learn certain fundamental and key skills that's going to help enhance them um, to be a more effective leader, um, in, not only in garrison but in combat as well. And, and that just goes on up to the advanced leadership course and the senior leadership course as you gain rank, right? Yeah. You're going to go to that next, that next schoolhouse to kind of increase um, your knowledge. And I think that those are, those are critical things that a lot of other uh, countries don't have, right? right. That they're not, they're not really – they don't see the value, or maybe they haven't until now, of actually putting their NCO core through a um, what you would consider like a, a mini OCS, right, or an IBOLIC, right? It would be the equivalent of that for the NCO core. Right. So I think that that's something that is um, really critical to that. What makes it so effective too is having those um, that structured learning too as you as you come up through the ranks as enlisted. Yeah. And Ian, and if you do, give me just a moment. I'm going to excuse myself for just a moment. I need oh, to run sure. into the other room really quickly. And if you want to kind of caveat off what I said or yeah. piggyback or walk that dog, I'll be right back. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. Yeah, no. Um, but no, Matt made a great point because there was a there was a recent article about 
I forget who published it. I want to say like foreign policy, but it was it was talking about the Chinese the Chinese military and how their NCO structure is set up. And what what was interesting is that it appeared that the Chinese officer corps and its NCO corps are still a lot of their promotions are still as a result of their political leanings and like who you know and that kind of thing and like loyalty to the party. Obviously, I'm not in China. China doesn't tell us everything. We're never going to know everything about China, but it does. It wouldn't be that far off historical trends, and it would not be far off that style of government that, again, is centralized in one person at the very, very top of the food chain. And that's that's the problem. And like, there's there's very few. I, I just I. The reality is like, if me and Matt are in combat, and I'm the captain, you know, I'm I'm giving orders. I'm doing this, this, and this. I go down. I can confidently say that Matt or any other NCO in that unit could literally do what I am doing and succeed, if not a little bit better, because that's what they do. And um, it, it's it's a strength that like you can't really quantify it. And it's it's impossible. It's really impossible to quantify it, I guess. But it's just something very few other people have, and it, it just makes me uh, it makes me happy. Um, Real quick, in answer to Lydria's question, it's 2 a.m. Yes, I will. this will be saved on YouTube after it's done, and then I will also upload to Spotify, Google, as a regular podcast after, so you can come back in later and listen if you like, but I appreciate you stopping by. Um, yeah, Matt, I don't know if you... Could you hear that when I was talking about China with its NCO yeah. core? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, won't, I won't go down that path again, but legit, like, I, I, I could get taken out. I know that an NCO, like an American NCO, probably a, a British NCO, French, whatever, could do the job just as well. Again, there's no doubt in my mind. And that, to me, again, is just something, one of those things that um, our, our adversaries just don't have. They just do not have that. On a, on a, I put 10 American NCOs in a trench and I put 10 Russian NCOs in a trench. Equal arms, equal everything. I, I still think we would come out on top. I just, I think we have that improvisation built in from the start. And I don't think they do. I really, I truly don't think they do. I could be wrong. And obviously we wouldn't, we wouldn't take that lightly. And I want to be clear. I don't want the U S fighting Russia. I don't, I don't want that. I don't think we want that either. Right. No, nobody does. So, and, and I totally understand what yeah. you're saying. So I'm, I'm just yeah. speaking like generally, I, I think us staying out of conflict is the best, bet. you know, I, that should Absolutely. be, that should be the thing, but, but this is our people. And, um, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be biased towards our people because I've worked with so many NCOs in my life now that I'm like a, I was raised by NCOs and ROTC, so I'm very biased towards you guys. Um, yeah, all it gets me all worked up. But uh, anyway, it's we it's, love you too. Yeah, it's an interesting cover. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. You just can't quantify it. It's never going to be on a sheet of NATO versus anyone else. You just it's just not going to be there. But uh, yeah. Anyway, any other thoughts about you know the NCO stuff or just just broad before we kind of transit? I have a specific question for you that I want to yeah I want to pivot no. to. One more, you know, one more thing, just to kind of go off what you were saying. Yeah, you know, this is this is how we train. This is how we structure our force. Uh, yeah. To always know the job, two jobs above you, right? So I want my machine gunner, you know, to know what it is to be a team leader and a squad leader. Right? Right. That's how we train. That's how I mentor. Um, and, and that's how I was mentored. That's how I was trained. You always want to know that role because if something happens, God forbid, uh, combat, war cell, um, you have to be ready to step into that role, and exactly what you said is correct. Um, and I think that's what makes our NCO core so effective is being able to step up and step into that PL or heaven forbid that CO role if it come to it, right? You know for a fact that that first sergeant or that E7, right, could step into that role if need be to take command and control and ultimately carry on uh, the mission. So yeah, right. but uh, so this uh, South American conflict, I've seen <laughs> some uh, some questions coming up. Uh, absolutely. Um, what else could go wrong, right? Uh, <laughs> let's just go ahead and get on, let's get every continent, right? Let's just go ahead and, and start knocking out everything. Uh, this is something that's new to me as well. I just recently was reading up on this today. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically Venezuela is laying claim to a, a, a really resource, resource rich part of Guiana. I believe that's how it's pronounced, pronounced, um, imperialism. Yeah, <laughs> imperialism in Oil? this I'm in this sorry. economy. Come on, what? Um, but apparently again, this was a geopolitical blind spot for me. Full full admission. I didn't know I didn't know shit about this situation. I just 
I started seeing Venezuelan troops moving to the border of, of one of their neighbors. And I was like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> I think I actually put that out on Twitter. I think I just said, what the hell is happening? I left it at that. Um, so they're, they, there's a resource, resource rich part of the country next to them. They basically would have to, from what my understanding is it's on the opposite side of the country that they would have to. So picture I'm in Pennsylvania. I want to annex the Western part of Ohio. So I have to travel through Ohio to annex it. That, that's my understanding based on some maps that I saw of what they're trying to annex. I don't understand the claim. It make, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't know if you any, know any more about it. I would love to hear your thoughts. I, it sounds like you're kind of in the same boat I am. Like we're kind of like. Yeah. I'm kind of both in the dark on this. Yeah. I, I have to say, well, um, maybe when Venezuela can manage what it already has, it can then start to worry about, <laughs> uh, you know, preying on its neighbors or its, its yeah. you know. This has completely dumbfounded me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the what the motive is here. Um, I don't know even if they did, you know, access this area. Is it something that they can manage? I mean, you know, the last I, I had seen, and this is it's horrible, and I hate this for the people of Venezuela. But I mean, we're talking extreme inflation, extreme poverty. Uh, you know, people were basically. Um, you know, walking into empty stores, empty shelves, money was being used as <laughs> fodder. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I'm not really sure exactly what's going on. Um, it's it's very surprising. It's very um, unexpected from this this region. This well, part of the world. I think I found. So I, I think I, I found know. the reason. I I paused it on the screen because I uh, I want to read this off. Guiana says another significant discovery made at the Stop Stabruck offshore block, which by the way is oil. Apparently they have discovered a sizable oil um, oil deposit. They were already already resource rich. In fact, Guyana Guyana is one of the fastest growing economic uh, economies in the world. I saw I saw an earlier um, document again. Don't quote me because I don't have it in front of me. Twenty percent annual growth economic, pretty wild for such a small country, uh, which is great for them because they were they I think they've been poor for a while. So. I suspect a lot of it's that. I, I saw some people suggest that maybe like it's Russian influence that's forcing them to. I don't know if it's all that. I think it's. I think what's happening is there's a lot of things that are coming to a head, sort of at the same time. Now they may they may think, hey, the world's distracted. I can pull this off. I'm just very pessimistic about the the Putin puppet master stuff. I I think it's bullshit. I don't think he's that smart, frankly. Um, but uh, I don't think so either. Yeah, but, but it, it, it seems uh, hundred plus days. But yeah, it seems to be mostly economic. Uh, they're just they're trying to they're trying to get resources, and like you said, Venezuela is struggling. So this is one. I mean, that's a good way to distract from struggles is military action and patriotism, right? I mean, that's happened mm -hmm. before. From every almost like a lot of we can't we can't we can't throw shade at that one historically, but um, true. You know, I think uh, as far as like U.S. U.S. involvement, kinetic U.S. involvement. I don't know. I don't. One it, right now, it seems like I don't think they're gonna do anything. I don't. I, I they're gonna they're gonna pick a fight with Brazil. They're gonna pick a fight with these other countries down there. I don't think they're gonna they're gonna go that far. If they do, again, it comes down to like what we were talking about earlier about kinetic deterrence. We need to either use it and defend countries like that, or we don't. There's reasons to say we should stay out of it. There's reasons to say we shouldn't. Um, I don't know, Matt. But your again, your your opinion as a as a as a grunt. <laughs> oh, pick up stick. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Uh, yeah, this is a tough one, and you know I don't want to tread in waters that I'm not too familiar with swimming in. Yeah, sure. Um, I will say though that um, I, I'm not a fan of picking on a smaller country, right? I'm not I'm not a fan of. Of just coming in and ravaging an area of its resources uh, just because you can. Um, so this is something that um, we're going to have to to watch and monitor very very closely um, and see exactly what the overall game plan is here. I kind of am on the same boat that you're on. I don't know if they actually would go through with this just because this once again could lead into a regional conflict that I don't think that Venezuela could sustain. Right. right. Um, and, and and ultimately too, unfortunately, I feel like there's going to be a lot of, heaven forbid there was a lot of, of civilian, uh, you know, casualties here, um, a lot of lot of suffering, a lot of displacement. So, yeah, this is something that I'm going to continue to read up and monitor uh, myself and get a little bit more informed before I start making 
um, you know, uh, a lot of more commentary on. But um, I, I guess ultimately um, it would come down to what's what's the right thing to do, uh, and also what is being done, right? Is there is it is this a military incursion? Is this a is this a strategic incursion, right? Where we know that that you know military targets are being uh, hit. Uh, we know that they're going after certain resource areas, or is this a hey I'm coming across and I'm just kind of swiping as I go, and we have a large um, civilian casualty issue or something where we might have to look at it from a humanitarian standpoint, like, hey, what's going on? Um, is this something that could be fixed with uh, with sanctions? Is this a, a thing that we need to get on the, get on the phone and, and start thinking of diplomacy? There's a lot of options that we have before we go kinetic. We know that, and I hope that that is what's being done currently. Um, but yeah, this is something that we're going to have to monitor relatively closely, and uh, I hate to see it. I really do. Yeah, yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, there are some people doing some uh, some military analysis compared to like uh, uh, Venezuela's neighbors and you know Brazil. It sounds like Brazil has let its air force or air forces uh, ne be, be neglected for a, a long period of time. So a lot of a lot of folks are saying they genuinely doubted if if Brazil could even prevent Venezuela from from doing anything. I, I, again, I don't know. It's one of those things I'm gonna have to read up on and get more familiar with. But um, right now, it seems pretty early. I don't know if anything's really going to happen for it, for, uh, happen there, but it's it's an interesting tidbit. On another tidbit, though, did you see? Speaking of South America, did you see the um, uh, Meli, the new Meli? I don't know his name. The new leader of Argentina, the liber yes, I libertarian did. He's guy, being referred to as the, the Hobby, Donald yeah. Trump uh, <laughs> of the area. He's not um, Donald Trump. He's a he's a libertarian. That's the <laughs> least Donald Trump thing you could possibly be. It's just because yeah, he has. I, a, I think it was it was because of the the, the aesthetic, right? It's it the bad the haircut. Hair. Yeah, the bad haircut. It's the bad no, haircut. Uh, I did see that, and I seen his video where he had the government institutions on this beautiful board, and he was just ripping them one by mm. one. Gone. See ya. Bye. Um, that's gonna be a very interesting um next several months uh for for Argentina. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. I I I. I got to tell you, the guy got me fired up and I couldn't even understand what he was saying, you know? <laughs> well, uh, so uh, that's the, th that's the thing though. Like I, I, I have, I have a lot of libertarian friends and like, uh, you know, there's something to be said for li many parts of libertarianism, you know, like it's get the hell out of my house and leave me alone. Got it. Sounds great. Uh, but the, the, the takeaways that I thought were super interesting were two things that happened again, we're pivoting like crazy right now just because, it's how it goes, right? <laughs> but it's how it goes. Um, We're gonna give you the most bro take on sensitive topics that you've ever had. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm gonna watch the tank biathlon army game. See how well Venezuelan tank crews do. So oh, that's wow. actually a good point. I have I have heard that the tank crew. I've seen that before. The Arge the Venezuelan crews were great. However, comma this area of Guiana is. As far as I know, this is all jungle in between. There's very few roads, so I don't know how effective armor would be there. But again, I don't know enough to comment intelligently, so I'll come back on that one. But anyway, um, caveat. I'm going to caveat back now. Two things happened in Argentina with this new guy. One, they have been talking about going into bricks, which I'm sure you're familiar with bricks. Mm -hmm. Bullshit, probably, you know, overall. But anyway, that's here nor there. One, uh, he came out yes, is it yesterday and said that um, Argentina will not join BRICS under his leadership. That doesn't mean this, that could change. That could be hedging bets, you know, to try to get some Chinese loans. Who knows? It could be anything. But the fact that it was said very, you know, very bluntly was an interesting little tidbit, I thought, from the grand geopolitical space that we're looking at. Yes, and the, the second one was that Argentina is going to fully dollarize completely yeah They're so gonna... that's crazy oh, man. that is crazy <laughs> because right off the rip he's not going to BRICS, and we know that BRICS, of course is challenging the united states the the, the global currency of course being the dollar right the, you right. know that's that's that that's ultimately what the whole premise of BRICS is um is to destabilize devalue lies and and ultimately replace right so um i gotta say heck yeah for that right you gotta be happy about that move what's his motive right we still don't really know i don't really know um, but that is, um, man, I tell you, it just, it was just so interesting to see that article and, and to watch those videos of this guy just absolutely coming in. And he, I mean, his, his plans are 
what some would con- you know consider here very radical, right? Oh yeah. Uh, elimin- elimination of, of a lot of, of government um, immediately right off the rip. So um, should be an interesting change of uh, chain of events that's going on in Argentina. It's it's a mess. I mean, the funny thing was, and according to, I'm on Bloomberg right now, just kind of read along, but an ex U.S. Treasury official was saying you should not dollarize <laughs> because they're thinking that. I mean, like it, a lot of South America just has you know is, is struggling economically, but it's very very interesting. I I, I just thought that was kind of out of the blue. I was not expecting that, um, but it's it's really bad. I mean, there's devaluation. It's kind of a mess right now. Um, that just seems to be across the board down there. But yeah, I'm I don't know curious. If it's something that implementation wise would be very feasible at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's a... This is an interesting tidbit, though. It would take about an 86% devaluation of the Argentinian peso in order to exchange the currency base into dollars, which would almost certainly trigger a depression, basically, is the, is the so what factor of that. Right. Yeah, I was looking at that graph, looking at the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Wow, that's that's very compelling. It's a it's a tidbit. That's the way I'll leave it it's at a that. It's a tidbit of information. <laughs> um, we have the technology. We have the technology. We can we can do it. So let me th- let's think of what comes next, right? Uh, we've been talking. We talked at the start about uh, we talked about drone warfare. You know, we started. We dived into a little bit about um, the changing face of conflict over the next 20 30 years i guess we should speak more broadly from your again your foxhole perspective what do you think is the overall arc of how things are changing what's what's your your big picture like what do you think is going to be prioritized what do you think the next conflict looks like that's what i really want to know god forbid again i want to i want to say it's not going to happen but history says that that does that's not a realistic scenario unfortunately Um, what do you think what let's start with this let me let me narrow it down what's the next real flashpoint that you are concerned about like certain about like imminent flashpoint that you think is the most likely to develop into a conflict first let's just start with that and then let's talk about it yeah so i I definitely think that the middle east obviously um (laughs) what a surprise ladies and gentlemen I, i feel like that that is kind of like the the current PUBG battleground right of <laughs> uh, proxy and 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 positioning and uh, kind of you know the, the the destabilization there i mean it's just absolutely horrendous i mean it's just something that i i can't ever you know remember in my small lifetime seeing it on this scale uh, and then not to talk about the other conflicts that are going on throughout the world but i think that the, the middle east does have the potential to really uh, you know, create a regional conflict because, you know, I, I think Hamas one was betting on the response that was given, right? However, I don't think that they were necessarily expecting the U.S. to be as assertive or or the posturing that was implemented off the rip. I don't think that they were really betting on that. I kind of think that they were were looking at things like, well, we can probably take advantage of the situation. Maybe it's the perfect storm. Um, maybe that we can draw in some of the neighboring Arab states in. Maybe we can get a gang in on Israel. Um, and I don't want to get too too down this rabbit hole, but I think that that ultimately could be, you know, um, a very very likely scenario. We're going to have to see how this plays out. Again, ceasefire just ended today. Literally minutes after the ceasefire ended, uh, military operations continued. Uh, the Israelis are on the push. They're being very very aggressive, which we've seen. Um, and also, too, you've seen just how um, effective that these these tunnel networks have been for for Hamas, uh, literally being able to emerge within meters of uh, of Israeli tank columns and infantry. So I think that the Middle East, once again, the being the powder keg that it is, unfortunately, and I feel so bad for a lot of the innocent people that are suffering because of this, could be the uh, flashpoint for a uh, if not global, maybe a regional conflict in that area. I think Iran and the shadow war that we've had going on could eventually spill over into something more kinetic, more force on force. Once again, we'll have to see. Ultimately, we talked about this earlier. If a U.S. service member is injured uh, or, or killed, uh, you know, to the point to where it's getting, uh, you know, it's, we've already had 59, right? So and that's what we know of. Uh, heaven forbid something happens where us or a coalition partner is killed. You know, is that what it's going to take, right? Is that what it's going to take to get more kinetic? Is that what's going to, you know, make it kind of boil over? Uh, per se, of what it is right now. 
hard to tell. But I think that that's kind of where my focus is, ultimately, is, is there. As far as Ukraine goes, uh, ultimately, we're, we're kind of at a stalemate. I think everybody can admit that, right? Um, we're kind of in this gridlock pattern. Not much has changed. We've had some ground uh, be taken. We've had some ground, um, you know, be lost. Um, but I think right now that the Middle East probably has the greatest opportunity for, you know, the boys, you know, hopping on the plane and getting back on the ground, if you know what I mean. Um, your thoughts? I was muted. Sorry, guys. I'm an I'm an asshole. <laughs> I had myself muted in here. It turns out, um, luckily, I didn't say much that was worth hearing. Right? Let's just. Oh, now I have a. I actually have a great chance here, Matt. I can sound smarter from the start. Wait, Matt, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry. Oh, no, I was you, catching up on some. No, you like com you completely froze in the video, and I was like, oh shit, I lost him. <laughs> Maybe it was just I'm good at uh, freezing. Anyway, practicing my manic. I'll start over. So what I was saying was, you, you were asking me about Iran. Uh, I I or the Middle East rather. I kind of disagree. To an extent, I think I would agree with you more if Iran seemed that it was um, if Iran seemed that it was going to truly getting involved in a kinetic manner. I'd be like, okay, shit's hitting the fan. Like we're about to get deployed. Like I, I, I believe that right now. I think that they, my vibe, and just, just again, I'm not in the know. I'm not an intelligence person. I'm just reading. I think that they were a little bit caught off guard by the whole attack. I don't think they were fully briefed in on exactly what was going to happen. I actually think that Hamas is was surprised by the rep the response and how vicious it was from Israel. I don't think they were really I don't really think they were factoring that in. I I know a lot of people were saying that they they did this on purpose so that Israel would overreact and that it would look ne negative on the news. I don't I don't know. I think there's probably an element of that. I'm a, I'm a little bit torn, but the long story short is I I think this is going to um I think Israel's going to probably accomplish its its objectives in in you know Gaza. I think it will. I I don't know if I like what's going to come after. That's the caveat. That's the bullet that's the, like the little asterisk is what comes after could very well lead into problems like what you described. I, I And that's that's kind of where I, the that I, the road I was kind of going down because I think that ultimately once uh, Israeli accomplishes its military objectives which we know is completely eradicate Hamas, Hamas right. and destroy the tunnel networks and ultimately then start working on establishing uh, uh government that can hopefully start to work towards a two-state solution or an integration, right? Or more integration, right, of of the two areas. It starts to look pretty dark. Right, because uh, I just I just don't know. I just don't I just don't know. Right. Especially after this, right? Especially after the displacement and uh, of course the Palestinian people uh, being as, as angry as they are, we understand. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that leads. So that's kind of like where I think that the Middle East could potentially be yeah. flash point. Um, yeah. And even even looking back up north, Ukraine, something's gonna happen, right? There there's there's we're kind of coming to a point to where what is what's the outcome here? How much more money? How much more resources? What is the the ultimatum? What's the objective? Right? Um, there could be something there as well. Um, yeah. It's 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 honestly a lot to digest. It's a lot to think about, and I don't want to say certain things that I think, uh, but it definitely could lead into something that nobody wants. Um, it's very scary. Honestly, uh, I think that ultimately, as far as the geopolitical overall, um, it's probably the worst that it's been in some time. Yeah. However, I do think that there's solutions to to all these. Right. Um, it's it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be sacrifices that have to be made. Right. Um, there's going to have to be a lot of dialogue, a lot of willingness. Right. To maybe compromise on certain territories or certain issues. Right. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, if we can stop the killing stop the conflict 
Uh, that's our ultimate objective. That's our ultimate foot goal and yeah. to keep the peace. Yeah. Um, yes. What do you think? Uh, Taiwan. I just, yeah. uh, I think uh, I fully believe that we're going to see something within our, he's definitely within our lifetime for sure. hundred um, percent. I think, you know, a lot of people are pointing out that China is struggling economically right now. And they were, there was actually some really interesting um well well researched documents that were put out suggesting that you know China was was kind of anticipated to overtake the US economy and like I think some early ones as early as 2025 ain't no way in hell at this point um another one was like 2030 which I you know a decade ago I would have been like okay maybe a lot of them don't think that we may even see it till 2050 2060 is some of the new estimates a few said maybe never Never at all. And the reasoning was because of the demographics and just the fact that, you know, the U.S. will always, for the for the most part, even though we also have some demographic, demographic issues in the future, we just have so many strengths over China when it comes to immigration and things like that. Um, I think that I think that is a potential one that, you know, again, some countries when they struggle economically or when they struggle politically, a very patriotic war to take back their lost territory is not the worst option you have. If assuming you have the confidence to win it and you have the ability to win it, um, you know, they're probably going to reach parity in, in, in certain things by 2025, certain things. We're obviously going to have our advantages. Of course, they're going to have some advantages too, like numbers and whatnot. But I think that they will potentially try something unless they're you know a pro-china politician in taiwan gets elected and all of a sudden the issue goes away you know um geo brings up a good issue a good point about you know armenia and uh, azerbaijan that could easily get out of hand too just like you said it's all yes. about like it's all about like this runaway good. train and then like there's superpowers backing up all sides you know and and it could easily it could easily get out of hand and and, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about, almost like a proxy, right? You know, yeah. you have major superpowers kind of picking their their pieces, right? Yeah. That can then boil over, unfortunately, and lead yeah. into a, a more kinetic force-on-force. Force yeah. Conflict. Yeah. And, and that absolutely does, um, uh, uh, you know, count. Yeah, like I don't, I don't think general. that, I don't think that, uh, I don't think Russia is anywhere near. They would, they're going to need another decade of replenishment to even try. God forbid they try to go to like to Estonia or Lithuania or any of them. I think that they uh I, they're gonna need they're gonna need a while. I mean it's been it was a decade between 2014 and 2022 or so, and we saw they weren't ready for that. I, I they're no, gonna need to replenish no. a lot of their stuff. I don't I just don't think they're gonna try that. If they do, God help you, man. I think Pol I think Poland's just chomping at the bit to be honest with you. But um so, so I'm kind of like I'm kind of like eh, on that one. Um. Again, Armenia, that whole thing is a is a is an issue. I think one underrated one that maybe isn't like a global war, but is really underrated is the Turkey and Greece. I think Yeah, you know, that's something that kind of uh well, just like Taiwan, you could say. Yeah. Um kind of fell out of the spotlight recently. Right. Um, with, with everything that's been going on. Uh yeah, there was at one point, uh, I mean, it was <laughs> it was getting pretty rowdy down there. It was, uh, the gloves yeah. were about to come off. Uh, I was very, very Concern, given the fact that both are, uh, you know, friends and partners. Uh, so and NATO allies. NATO allies, <laughs> and, and once again, it kind of brings us back to when we were in Syria dealing with the uh, ordeal that we dealt with. Oh, with Turkey, God. Um, you know, uh, wanting to come down and, and create that that security zone. Yeah. So yeah, man. So uh, like I said, what a time to be alive. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, Unfortunately, those pieces could move to the point to where our piece moves. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But there's a lot of flashpoints. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, there's some really good takes. Um, a lot of good conversation. Uh, right. It's going to be a uh, – I think going into 2024, we need to keep our eyes open. Uh, there's a lot to watch. There's a lot to look for. I'm hoping that things calm down, of course. I'm hoping that diplomacy wins overall. But uh, – 2024 is going to be a very, very interesting year. And then just finishing out 2023, this is going to be very interesting to see uh, what's going to take place. Right. Well, we also have an election coming up, and that's always a shit show. So, Yes, it is. Um, I'm really curious how that's going to going to change the, the global landscape as well. 
if we do see a potential, uh, if just say, for instance, if the GOP does take in and, and get Trump back in, you know, that mm -hmm. could be a completely different scenario compared to if Biden comes back in. So, um, right. I, I mean, I'm not sure. Here, here, um, here's also the reality on that. Like, exact, dude, like when Trump was elected in 2016, I didn't want to go into politics too much. I'm going to just dabble into it. We can, we can, but, we can, you know, be mild. Yeah, no, but like, I'm not going to go like down like the, oh, he, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Yeah, no, um, absolutely not. But when Trump was elected in 2016, people lost their shit. They really did. Absolutely. And the reality is, if you really, really look at it, not that much really changed. Honestly, there were some dumb decisions made. There was dumb decisions made in the administration before. I, I, if you look back, there was truly nothing crazy. And the reason for that is like, we always see every single election. This president went like Obama cleared the house. got the, I think they got state. I think they got the Senate and the house when he got elected. Cause you know, the, he was really, really popular. The very, very next election. I'm pretty sure both houses flipped. If I recall, and the same happened with Trump, both houses flipped. And for the most part, things balanced back to normal American politics, which is a shit show. So, so like that it is, I might be, I might be like hopelessly optimistic, quote unquote, but like, I don't think it's nearly as apocalyptic as a lot of people think. I think people that are running for office say shit to charge up their base, but the reality on the ground is way different when you're actually in power, as we saw that that's, that's my kind of like my, my broad take. I do. I am. I am a little concerned about some of the statements about NATO. I think it's purely posturing. I hope I'm. I hope I'm right. Um, I think that. I don't think the U.S. would pull out of NATO. I, I truly don't think that would ever happen. That is a absolutely not. That that's, is a, that's a stupid move. It's a tremendous sign of weakness, and at least one politician is very, very focused on his or her strength. I don't think that he or she would do that. <laughs> I don't but, either. I, I, I think that's a complete and utter. Um, destabilization that right. that would have a ripple effect that would be just detrimental right so so and that goes back to like even the ukraine aid stuff i still think that ukraine's going to get aid here soon i think they're going to come to Same. an agreement and it's going to go Same. through a lot of the apocalyptic stuff on twitter about abandonment and betrayal i'm like it's u.s politics they suck i i get it but like this this is how it works unfortunately sometimes i think that aid will come back i think they just sent some more recently too with like high mars rockets and stuff I, I don't I don't know. Um, you, you know, you got to think. I mean, we've we've been there since the beginning, right? Right. We, we have done a lot. Yeah. To be honest. Um, you know, um, like you said, politics is a oh god, it's a hot mess. Yeah. I think that that of course there's going to be more funding uh, that that gets in there. Um, what we really really got to start focusing on how do how 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 do we bring this thing to a head, right? How do how do we right. figure out how do we end it to get through this because it has to end. And, yeah. Um, you know, we're getting to that point to where we really have to start thinking about that long and hard yep. uh, outside of funding, outside of weapons. But diplomacy overall is going to have to be the victor of this yeah. conflict. And I pray for that for, for both parties. Yeah, it's, al it's also worth remembering that, you know, when Japan, like Japan surrender at the end of World War Two, that was diplomacy. So like a lot of people see like I think people overreact a little bit. They see that diplomacy is going to end this war and they see that as a sign of a surrender. I'm like, that's not what that means. You can win a war kinetically. It's still going to end in the in, in the in the back of the room with someone with you guys signing documents and shaking hands. That's just the reality. Yes. So, yes. absolutely. But there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know. I, think, <laughs> I, I think the Ukrainian the Ukrainian people have to understand they have proven themselves, right? Yeah. To the world. Oh yeah. Um, they have nothing. They have nothing to prove to anybody. That's 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 off the table. Right. Uh, I think that that a a great. Um, uh, I think I'm looking at the word the word i'm looking for here uh they've made a statement right um the statement was made very very clear um so yeah i agree with you 100 percent on that brother um, I, i'm gonna laugh at this comment though i just i have to interrupt you because of it um from padrig vivek invades mexico for some reason 2025 vivek. <laughs> <laughs> I, vivek is a he's a ball of energy isn't he i think i think he's just posturing to be a trump's vp candidate personally That's i i <laughs> I am so glad you said that because I think it's I all said it that is. multiple times and people are like, oh, there's no way. I'm like, well, you got to think about it. He treads very, very carefully, right? Whenever he is uh, uh, talking about uh, Trump. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've not heard him say anything detrimental that would put him on the naughty list. For right. Trump. 
Um, it's usually, you know, amping up the uh, uh, the Trump campaign. But I think that uh, they, they do have a lot of uh, similar ideology, and, and they come from basically the same background when you think about it, right? Right. Uh, both very successful businessmen. At the end of the day, you know, um, like you said, when Trump was in office, not much did change, right? Because one thing that our forefathers and our founding fathers did very, very well was – they realized that things could get out of control very quickly, so they put checks and balances in place and yeah. made our government what it is. Thank God they did. God bless them. God rest their souls. Um, so <laughs> that being said, you know, whoever does win, I think ultimately at the end of the day, it'll be uh, business as usual. Uh, some people will be upset. You know, some things might not be the way you want them, but at the end of the day, that's how things go when you have an election, right? Yeah, yeah. I will say unequivocally, though, that invading Mexico against their will is stupid. Absolutely. That is the stupidest um, thing I think I've ever heard in my life. I mean, imagine there's definitely nothing can go wrong with starting a war on our border that might breed an insurgency that then starts planting IEDs in El Paso, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have an October 17th on the uh, southern border, right? That's the thing you got to think about. And well, the real threat is not Mexico itself. It's mainly the cartel, which is uh, right out of control, right? We know that. Um, right. And there's been talks about military action against uh, the cartel, and, and that's a whole other you know, rabbit hole that you can go down as well. Uh, yeah, right. that's just a little asinine to so, think that, so there that would was, be a good idea. There was something interesting that I wanted to call out. So, again, a lot of a lot of candidates were talking about basically like a Mex- – the thing I've noticed is that there's this trend saying that Mexico is our enemy and they're purposely allowing drugs and, and stuff to come into the country because they're our enemy. That's ridiculous. Mexico is a military and economic ally. Mexico replaced China as our biggest training partner this year. I don't know if you knew that. That's significant. I did not know that personally. That's a, that. Wow. That's significant. Really? Yeah. So that's part of okay. that's part of like a purposeful attempt to get it started in the Trump administration. The Biden administration's kept it going and maybe escalated it a little bit, but to decouple from China um, in, in many places economically, Mexico became our top trading partner. That's awesome. We want Mexico to be our tra- one of our top, including Canada. Next that's door, great. absolutely. So I mean, that's perfect. Yeah. So so like a war, <laughs> just invading just and trying to take out. Yeah, it's about. just fucking yeah, stupid. It's just, but it's stupid. But what was what was interesting is that uh, I'm sharing a Reuters article from two days ago was that the Mexican president uh, actually asked his his lawmakers to allow U.S. military trainers and I think the I think the so what factor for that was special forces into Mexico yep, to train I've seen that as well. To train and possibly he was. And I, I suspect I suspect maybe also to actually do some counter cartel stuff with Mexican military and police. That I agree with a hundred percent. If Mexico if Mexico agrees with us and lets us do that, great. We just have to be really, really careful about it because that also can get out of control, right? And then next yes, thing you can. like I said, next thing you know, the hundred and first is deployed to Tijuana. And then it's a whole different ballgame, and it's a it's a That's shit. That's a very show. real reality. Yeah, uh, you know, people have to understand the cartel is not just a couple boys with some with some hunting rifles out no, there. No, they are not the We're Taliban. About a very very well organized, well oiled machine, right? With military grade hardware, uh, with an extensive tunnel network. They've been <laughs> doing this for years. Right. They have infiltrated multiple levels of police and government within the country as well, so that gives them a certain level of intelligence. Yep. Uh, to see what's coming. That's another scary thing as well right Mm -hmm. um so if if there is something that we can do to help the mexican government that is going to help systematically take these entities down uh, i'm all for it um we know that there is a risk given with those types of operations but i think that ultimately at the end of the day if it's going to save american lives if it's going to stop fentanyl from pouring across our borders uh, it's going to stop the death of, of innocent mexican people as well along with u.s civilians um eventually things get to a point to where you have to do something about it, right? Right. I think that's kind of the narrative uh, tonight that we've seen. Sometimes <laughs> you got to do something about it, right? Um, yeah, I, I saw that and I was I was very very happy to see that. I thought right. that was a very positive article that I that I got to read. Um, yeah, I just I just don't know. Like, I don't know if you can truly stop stop the flow. You know what I mean? I mean, as, if there is a if yeah, there is a user, yeah, yeah. there's always going to be a supplier, and that's the no, reality. I think that you can definitely deter and and you can you can hinder. Um, to, to ultimately to stop, we know what that takes, and that's right. not really on the table. Um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Redacted. Yeah. Redacted. Uh, no, but um, 
Yeah, I think that we can definitely slow it. We can stop it and maybe funnel yeah. it and kind of control it better. Um, you know, but it's definitely good to see those types of relationships. You know, uh, with Mexico, that's what yeah. you want with your with your neighbor. Well, and there's also an opportunity. You know, if we work if we work well enough with the Mexican government, the reality is most of the fentanyl is coming from China. That's that's exactly. another thing, and and I strongly suspect that a lot of that it's very intentional. And uh, during that recent meeting, I believe with Biden and uh, Z, that was actually a topic was coordinating to stop the flow of fentanyl out of China into the U.S. So like, there's I think that's the tar- I think that's the ticket. They have to find the source, interdict it away from Mexico, even before it gets there. They got to stop it getting here somehow. Um, because like they there, obviously there's meth, there's other drugs, you know all that shit. But fentanyl is like that. That is a killer, dude. That's producing those zombies, you know. Um, people yes. just j- jacked up. Uh, they just got to find Especially a way. To- huge yeah, hazard to law enforcement and our first responders as well. Yeah. Um, and you know you you've seen time and time again, it doesn't take much, uh, to get someone to a to a certain level. No. And it also doesn't take much to kill somebody. It does um, not. And and it's it's tainted everything. Um, so. I uh, would love to see us be a little bit more proactive about that and see if we can't, you know, spearhead a, a something to get that reduced. And I do agree with you 100%. I think China is to- fully taking advantage of that, along with the cartel, right? It's all about money at the end of the day. Uh, if they can make more money and pump more drug, uh, and then they have uh, guys coming over to teach them how to do it more effectively, right? Therefore, making more money, of course they're going to do it. So that's something that has to be cut out. Yeah. Um, and I also read about that too in the meeting with Xi Jinping in uh, California. It's yeah. good to see San Francisco get cleaned up for once, huh? Oh. Wow, they really laid out the the Bro. red carpet for a uh, for a dictator, huh? Oh, God. So here's the thing. Yes, that is bullshit. That's that's bullshit. I yeah, it is hundred percent. I also like. I also want us to stay talking to China because not talking is bad. Because even not talking is always bad. Yeah, because yeah. even like with the Soviet Union, at our worst moments in history, we were still talking to them. We still had the Soviet premier in the U.S. meeting with our president. You know what I mean? So like, I, the the cleanup thing is all I care about. Like, I, we should. Ha- I think he. Sh- I think him coming here was good because it, him and Biden need to be on camera together. They they needed to be there. That was good. That whole cleanup thing was bullshit. That was bullshit. It was it was that, a horse and pony show and right. and I just I was kind of taken back and dumbfounded. Um, I, I wasn't at all. I, I wasn't dumbfounded because um, I knew exactly. I I I knew it. As soon as they announced the place, I was like, mm, it's going to look a little bit different than what it looks right now. now it I, also made for an interesting debate uh, with against uh, with Gavin Newsom and, and Ron DeSantis as well, mm-hmm. which was once again kind of like, okay. Uh, that, that might cool. be a, that might be another uh, that might be another live that show. Might be a whole other episode. Uh, and again, listen, I'm not trying to get into politics. It's just it's just kind of ironic, right? It's kind of funny yeah. some of these things that happen. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I gotta I gotta put this one point that when Ron pulled out a a map of San Francisco and he's like, "Hey, uh, you might notice this is a map of San Francisco, and what you have here is uh, plots of human fecal matter that were on the streets that was cleaned up for a communist dictator," and I was like. Oh, it was <laughs> dude. That, that whole debate was uh, that whole debate was nasty. Yeah, that was a was na- it was brutal. nasty. It was brutal. And once again, American politics. If you guys need anything to put that into context, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, especially our friends across the pond and around the world, yeah. if you look at that debate, you'll kind of see exactly what it's all about. It sums it up. Pretty, pretty I know. Well. But you know what sums me up well? I just walked away just hating everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, why not? We already did in the first place, and yeah. it just you know, kind of. Uh, uh, festers the hatred, but uh, I know. I, man, but... isn't it crazy how much crap that we we've, we've been able to talk about? There's so many talking points <laughs> that you can go down a, a nice little rabbit hole with. Oh God, I'm um, telling you, man. That's that's why I was excited to do wow. this. Uh, I was excited to do this live format with you. One because I was hoping to get some questions, which I was really happy. I appreciate everyone joining and actually asking us some really, absolutely, really good questions and uh, making me laugh a few times, and also calling me out when I was muted because I'm an asshole and I don't know how to do streaming apparently. But uh. <laughs> No, but oh, like, like I think, um, yeah, like like you said, there's just there's so much. I think what I want to do next time we chat, because we gotta do this again, of course. But what I would like to do is 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 focus on one specific, um, one or two specific things, and just extrapolate even more. Because like we talked about, we talked about drones, and that took up actually like the first hour of our entire conversation, you know, which is good yeah. because it was important, and there's a lot to talk about. But you know, I'd love to. I want to talk about the army the army's role in the Pacific. I, I think 
everyone thinks it's Marines and it's Navy. It's more complicated than that. The Army has, the Army's bringing back, you know, coastal artillery in the form of hypersonic missiles. That's a big deal. The Army's got a role to play in the Pacific. Um, the Marines are starting to to change change how they're how they operate. Um, they're they're bringing they're kind of going back to this this kind of sort of World War II era feel, you know. Uh, I think getting a Marine on here, someone actually recommended uh, a guy I talked to on Twitter a lot. I think bringing him on here and let's talk about the Marines and the Army and how how a war Absolutely. in the Pacific would look. I think we should do that. So Absolutely. Um, with that, man, I think this is actually a good time for us to to wrap up. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of yeah. I'm gonna kind of ramble for a minute to see if anyone has any last minute questions for you or myself. But um, with that, any any last words of wisdom or key things that you're interested in kind of want to bring up before we, before we part ways? No, I, first of all, uh, thanks for having me on and yeah, everybody man. that decided to, to join us tonight. Thank you so much. Some great questions, some great commentary, some good laughs. Um, you know, I think ultimately my message to everyone here, uh, in the chat, let's just stay positive, right? It's so easy to get negative and, and think <laughs> about these things and, and be upset, but you know, let's just try to stay positive to each other, especially going into the holiday season. Um, and ultimately just hope for the best. Yeah. yeah, man. Thanks. And I got uh, a phone call coming in, and I'm gonna listen to you ramble while I take this call. But thank you, you, son of a jerk. Here I was. Okay, everyone. We just need to think of insults to throw his way. Um. Anyway, like I said, uh, any any last minute questions, I appreciate. But other than that, we're gonna wrap up tonight. Um. I I'm I'm glad y'all were able to come by and ask some questions. It was it was fun. Uh, this is actually a question for Matt. It looks like. Did you get a chance to try the rocket? The the dumb the dumb emote is blocking the word. I can't actually see it. Rakaja, Rakaja, Kosovo. Rakaja. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there what? was a lot of uh, wow, man. I I absolutely enjoyed every moment that I was there. Uh, there was I got to see both um, uh, Albanian cuisine. I got to experience uh, Serbian cuisine. Oh, so it's food. Um, I got to see the, uh, some sites, uh, as far as what he's referring to. Yeah. Um, I, to be honest with you, maybe, because again, you got to think I'm a dumb American. I don't know. Um, I, basically my, my interpreter would, uh, kind of take us into these local areas. Uh, he would show us the sites. He would show us different, you know, cultural cultural uh, points of significance, and also to order us just random plates of food. Um, and I apologize if that is me just being a ignorant, dumb American. But I am not going to tell you that I had something that I don't know if I had. But I had a lot of really interesting foods that were amazing. Um, so yeah. I will say I missed that. Um, I missed that. Yeah. Uh, Chris... wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I'm sorry, Rakia. Oh my goodness! Oh, Rakia! Yes, you had to put it like that. There you, you go. Spell out for my dumb, you know what? Absolutely did. I think that I think that you could launch a SpaceX rocket with that stuff. Um, oh, I get it. Potent. Um, I, I I loved it actually. It was really good because I'm from the South. I'm from uh, the Appalachian uh, this region shit. here in the United States. Uh, so it was kind of on par with our moonshine. But dang, man, you, there were some different flavors, and I got to have some some locally made stuff. And then when I went over to Montenegro and Croatia, I got to have some stuff over there too. Um, <laughs> I really did enjoy it, man. It was it was stout, it was potent. Um, so wait, I'm, wait, it's an alcohol? It's a liquor? It is an alcohol. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was like a food. No, and see, that's what threw me off. So when when Lewis, you know, spelled it out that way for my <laughs> ignorant ass to be able to understand it. You know, um, I, I was like, ah, yes, Rakia. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, man. I got to, of course, I, I did not experience it on duty by no means. Of uh, course, yeah. You would never do anything action. like that ever. All actions were conducted off of time. It was on my own personal leave. Right. And you definitely uh, would never try Turkish whiskey or whatever it was in Syria. I would never, uh, you know, I would never do that. And I would always insult a gracious national host. That was trying to offer me something in good faith to foster relationships and ultimately the heart and mind campaign of the United States military and Department of Defense. So, <laughs> gentlemen, I am a by the book kind of man. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Not. Um, I was going to add, though, I missed that. Um, I have picture. The one picture I did take was that. Uh, I remember, actually, I don't know if you were with us, but our interpreters in Iraq made us dinner on Christmas. Their sisters came on base and they made us this huge meal. Oh, my God, it was so good. 
everything everything was so good i miss it i don't i can't name any of it but it was it was amazing a lot of meat a lot of veggies a lot of meats yeah that's the beautiful thing about that area man it's yeah all the food's fresh it's great oh yeah uh, the, the the food's just so amazing but yeah man um once again dude awesome chat with you awesome yeah, chat with everyone um i got a, a good friend of mine that's about to, to pull up over here to the to the house this evening we're we're having some dinner very nice. I'm not trying to be blunt, but um, <laughs> ultimately, uh, old dad is on a little bit of a schedule this evening. Oh boy! Um, thank you all so much for uh, for for being here and and chatting with us and uh, you know and making me remember how ignorant I am uh, to not understand that you were talking about a liquor. So that was very very funny. Yeah, you had you had that. enough of it that it impacted your memory. It's normal. Absolutely. <laughs> well, all right man hey we're gonna do this again soon i'm gonna queue up uh i'll queue up another one uh, like i said we'll chat i'd like to get a marine on and, and and get some uh get their perspective on uh on a pacific campaign so uh with that man again thanks for joining me as always i i appreciate you uh thank you for your service <laughs> hey brother thank you for having me it's always an honor and and i love catching up with you and and of course we'll we'll, we'll get on uh some stuff together off air but i uh, hope everyone has a great holiday uh, wherever you are, whatever you celebrate, uh, stay safe, stay oh, warm. Yeah. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen. All right, man. I appreciate you.